Good morning. Um, welcome to the August 24th, 2021 meeting, regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, first of all, we'd like to have a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance. And I would like to just say, let's uh, all have our thoughts and prayers with those, especially who are caught in a very, very difficult situation in Afghanistan. We just hope for their safety and God bless them. And we just hope that they return uh, as quickly as possible. Chair, if we could have a roll call first. Excuse me, I, that's on my mind, I guess, right now. So please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. No. McPherson. Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you again. I uh, got ahead of myself. A uh, moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. You've heard my concerns. Uh, anybody, any other supervisor want to speak on anything? No. We have uh, Supervisor Koenig and myself and the board chamber. The, us, the three other members are going to be joining the meeting uh, by remote. Uh, so we'll have a moment of silence and then the pledge of allegiance. States of America, <coughs> to the Republic, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do you have consideration of late additions to the agenda and additions and deletions to the consent and regular agendas, Mr. Palacios? Yes, on, uh, we do have a few items on the regular agenda. Item number seven, uh, there's additional materials the presentation on the pension obligation bond issuance. Um, uh, and there's also a public comment received on August 24th. On item 12, there's additional materials. There's a public comment received on August 23rd. On item 13, there's additional materials, public comment received on August 24th. And then on the consent agenda, there's additional materials, public comment received on August 24th. And that concludes the uh, revisions to the agenda, Chair. Thank you. Uh, any announcement by more members of items removed from the consent to the regular agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull item 26 and just make it right after item eight, which is uh, our other cannabis items, since there's some related actions to it. Maybe if we can make it 8.1 if that's possible now, or? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll make a comment on the consent agenda on uh, number 24 and uh, also on 26. Okay. Okay. Do, do you want to make a. Oh, wait. Okay. Go ahead. Um, no, that's all right. Yeah. Well, we'll wait for the, he's wait not for looking to pull the item. He just wants to make comments, yeah, right. which yeah. we'll do after we accept public comment on these items. Correct. I might, uh, I might pull it uh, for. The part of number 24, D, E, and F. You want to pull item 24? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Let's see, we'll make that item. Let's see here. Um, okay, we'll make that. Um, I guess we should. Try to get that in the morning session, so I think. Um, try to make that uh, item 12.1. Number, number 24 will be 12.1. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments? Announcements by board members, items removed to the consent to the regular agenda. Heard that. Uh, Ms. Cabrera, do you want to announce our procedure? Just for clarification, item 26 is moving to 8.1, and item 24 is moving to 12.1. Right. Okay, and now for public comment. Now is the time for public comment. If you wish to comment and are joining us through the Zoom link, please find the hand icon at the bottom of your screen and click on the icon to raise your hand. If you are calling in from a phone, 
please dial star nine now. This will raise your hand and place you in the queue to speak. If you're here in chambers, please line up at the podium. Ahora es el tiempo que la Junta Directiva de Supervisores recibirá comentarios del público. Si gustaría dar su comentario en español, tenemos un traductor disponible para asistir. Si desea comentar y se ha unido a través de Zoom, busque el icono de la mano en el fondo de la pantalla y hazle clic. Si estás llamando, por favor, marque estrella 9. Si estás aquí en el salón, por favor, forma la fila enfrente. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just add, uh, any person may address the board once during the public comment, not exceeding two minutes. Uh, comments must be directed uh, to items on today's consent and closed uh, session agendas yet to be heard items if you can't be here later on the regular agenda or on a topic not on today's agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. We'll take public comments <coughs> for uh, 30 minutes and if necessary, additional time for public comments will continue after our regular agenda, which is going to be going into the afternoon today. Yes, sir. You're the first. Hello, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, I guess my comment kind of addresses the truth as a perspective, and that is within the scope of everyone listening to this and everyone behind me and on this other side of this maritime courtroom. Um, the subject of Afghanistan is, I find, really fascinating and why there's a sensationalness of what's going on in Afghanistan, and there are some real tragedies going on, but tragedies in Afghanistan are nothing new. Um, to the extent of the 1,575 pages that I didn't spend an incredible amount of time looking into, but I did find several that I of interest, and I'm glad that I was able to download that, and I took a picture of that large volume. I may show up here and talk tomorrow, because there's another public meeting and Thursday. But once again, what is in control of this board? Um, you guys have a lot of leeway, and it's really up to how you guys want to present to the public now and in the future. Um, you know, the Taliban was an organization created in the 80s by the US CIA. And uh, that's, you know, Al Qaeda is really not that much different. So the Taliban decided to reduce the opium production in Afghanistan by 97%. And soon after 9-11, uh, um, the US invaded Afghanistan. And within a year, thanks to the US military, opium production was more than it was ever before. So to jump to what happened a couple weeks ago and people apparently billions of dollars of armaments have been um, just released. That makes whoever recaptures those armaments one of the most powerful armies in the world. But I'd like to focus on what's going on in the United States. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Serge Cagno. I'm the Mental Health Advisory Board and uh, Executive Director of Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. I'm glad everybody's healthy today and here. Um, there is a, a written correspondence, letter J, which you helped write, and I appreciate that. Um, Suicide Prevention and Recovery Month, uh, the proclamation. Um, I am not representing the whole Mental Health Advisory Board, just to be clear, just myself. Um, very uh, supportive and compassionate proclamation. Uh, I just wanted to ask, one, there's the phrase substance abuse used twice in there, and I was just going to ask if we could use the phrase substance use disorder, since we're talking about awareness for people and trying to destigmatize that thing. Um, but otherwise, absolutely beautiful proclamation, and I thank you for writing it. Um, Number seven, you guys are going to talk about vaccinations for county staff. And I also appreciate you guys sometimes uh, going against some of the public opinion that happens these days and actually keeping people safe and trying to, uh, you know, do what you have to do. Thank you. Have a Thank great you day. for your service, too. Yeah. Much appreciated. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman, Board of Supervisors. Um, this is one report from the University of Sydney. A uh, infectious disease professor says, as soon as the mask becomes saturated with moisture, your breath stops doing their job and past droplets, a pro process that takes only 15 minutes. Uh, last year, the supply of N95 surgical masks were used, and he says that they were uh, uh, totally uh, worthless. 
Um, we've got the uh, CDC's uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety. It says that uh, they uh, warn that even surgical masks do not provide the wearer with reliable level of protection in inhaling smaller airborne particles and is not considered respiratory protection. Uh, JAMA reports uh, the, that German uh, schools uh, that they, they tested, the environmental office noted that the children's ailments were related to elevated carbon dioxide inhaled and their findings suggest that children should not be forced to wear their mask because they have six times the amount of carbon dioxide that is permissible in a, in a room. Um, I'm also very concerned about uh, the very fact that this is a organized program uh, the county was warned over a decade ago about the vaccines that were coming. Uh, the COVID plan of Rockefeller called Lockstep 2010 is available. Our community foundation, which has a Hugh DeLacy social justice fund, a uh, man responsible for the death of tens of thousands of Americans and hundreds of thousands of uh, Chinese. Um, anyway, uh, Carlos Palacios was on the board of directors when they allowed a lady by the name of Margaret Lopez to decide which businesses stay open and which don't. Those businesses that were shut down should look into a RICO uh, organization. The person that funded that lady should be public and anybody that's keeping that quiet should be under the uh, jurisdiction of the DA for malfeasance. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody here, anybody else in the room that would like to address this? Anybody virtually? There are eight speakers, nine speakers on Zoom. Okay. Carol, your microphone is available. Good morning, this is Carol Bjorn, and I want to echo what Gary just said. We need to have mass choice for the kids in our schools. I would invite everyone to come to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board meeting tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. in Watsonville to speak on this item. Um, in addition to that, discrimination is alive today in the schools of Santa Cruz County. Please call Ferris Sabah and the County Office of Education Trustees today and ask them to remove all policies that discriminate against the unvaxxed students. Currently, if a student is only exposed to a COVID positive person and that person displays no symptoms, that person must quarantine for 10 days if they are unvaxxed. The vaxxed do not have to quarantine. Not only is this discrimination, but it's also coercion. In 1975, Amnesty International created a report on torture in that report, it included Biderman's chart of coercion. The first item on that list is isolation. So you have schools across this county, not only discriminating against the unvaxxed students, but also applying coercive techniques to get them to comply. In addition, this policy violates the student's right to medical privacy. By treating the unvaxxed differently in this way, everyone will know who is unvaxxed. Please call Ferris Sabah, and all County Office of Education trustees today, ask them to immediately remove these discriminatory and coercive practices. And please make a public statement denouncing these discriminatory and coercive practices. If you all fail to act, and if you all fail to do this, then you are saying it's okay to discriminate, and you're saying it's okay to use coercive practices. Personally, I think we should all be supporting our students no matter what. And I appreciate the man who spoke about suicide prevention. How do you think these kids are going to feel when they're being singled out this way? We need to really be respectful of mental health and not discriminate. Good morning. I'm offering comment today on item 26 of the consent agenda, which has now been pulled to the main agenda. This is regarding the county's ongoing cannabis licensing operations. My family has lived, worked, and run businesses across Santa Cruz County for almost 40 years. And while I understand the county's economic interest in cannabis industry revenues and the policy decision you've made to support the cannabis businesses, I want to urge this board to also carefully consider the current negative impacts that commercial cannabis cultivation and manufacturing operations are having and will continue to have on sensitive environments and the families and neighborhoods across your districts. 
Specifically, this morning, I'm asking this board to consider at a future meeting several amendments to the existing Santa Cruz County Code dealing with non-retail licensing to include one, a public notice and public hearing process for all future commercial cannabis operations, regardless of the size and location, two, a robust appeal process for any licensing and or permit decisions related to commercial cannabis, and three, enhanced setback requirements for any commercial operation near established residential homes, parks, and facilities serving children. Uh, these amendments will, one, bring back much needed transparency to this current mostly secret process, two, improve public trust and confidence in the process, and three, demonstrate that the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors prioritizes protecting our sensitive environments and the quality of life for all county residents as much as generating tax revenue from the cannabis industry. Thank you. user one your microphone is available hello this is becky steinbruner can you hear me hello Hello, I can't hear anything. I heard the last speaker, but Thank after you. that, I'm not able to hear anything. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? 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 I yes, cannot you're... hear anything, and I am not sure that you can hear me. I can hear you, Becky, that's Ryan Coonerty. Oh, good, thank you. Thank you for responding. Um, can the rest of the board hear me too? Start for two minutes. Ms. Steinbrenner, this is Zach. I can hear you. I don't know if the board chambers can hear you right now. That's the that's the issue. I'm not hearing the board chambers either. Yeah. Wow. Um, can we, we resolve that problem before I give my testimony? I, I can hear you also. Becky, we yeah. can hear you but, in the board chambers. All three of you are participating remotely. Is that correct? Yes. So there seems to be a problem. Um, I would like my testimony heard by all in. Becky, why don't you just hold on and we'll, we'll, we'll wait until the, okay. until the board comes back. Oh. We need. Becky? This is Ryan. I've been told that the chambers can hear you. So go ahead. All right. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Kennedy, friend, and Caput for confirming that you can hear me. And I'm hoping that the rest of the board and any audience members that in the board chamber can as well. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Apta. Um I will not be able to stay for today's um, 130 session on the county taking possible action to mandate COVID injection of all county employees. I, I, I am not supportive of this at all and hope that your board will not require all county employees to be vaccinated. I want to point out to you that the International Association of Firefighters in their uh, July 30th news release state, we strongly encourage all firefighters and emergency medical personnel to get vaccinated, but do not support vaccine mandates. The county should take this as a cue. These are our frontline workers, and they are not supportive of mandating vaccines. Requiring this and requiring those who, for whatever reason, choose not to get the injection is discrimination and would violate the American Disabilities Act. I would also like to point out to you that a number of members of the public have received uh, responsive materials from the 
the county of Santa Cruz and also from the California State Health Department saying there is no um, documentation of the isolation of the SARS-CoV-2 organism in human beings. There is no documentation of that material uh, in isolation. I want to um, jump back a bit. I find it curious that two items have been pulled from the consent agenda. One has been put for action at 8.1 immediately. The other one was shoved off to later in the day. I request that item number 12 be put as item number 8.2 in all fairness, and that is a better procedure to support the public comment. Uh, for people who are waiting here to be part of that hearing. Um, Becky, we have reached time. Thank you. I, uh, in closing, I just want to say there is an item on the consent agenda requesting um, uh, an evaluation of, of different departments and California uh, County Fire has been added to that. I support that. County Fire and Cal Fire need to be held accountable. Thank you, Colin, user 7780. Your microphone is available. Hello, this is Craig Patterson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, this is primarily a District 2 issue, and I would like some feedback because I'm not sure where to go. Uh, the area between Freedom and Larkin Valley Road has had about four powder, power outages in the last uh, month, from July 29th, 10th of August, 14th of August, 20th of August. They've lasted about five hours each. As best we can tell from someone talking to a representative from pg e they seem to have a sensor issue where a very sensitive sensor is triggering a power outage, which then takes them five hours to restore power. Um, PGE has not acknowledged what this issue is in phone calls, and I don't know where to go to try to uh, resolve this and see if we can have them change the equipment or do something else instead of these uh, weekly power outages. So I would like some feedback from a uh, supervisor friend or someone else. I don't know if this is a, uh, I'm not sure if this is actually a board of supervisors issue or which board would be responsible for going back and talking to PGE and getting resolution on this. My, my suggestion is that uh, he writes su supervisor friend who will pass that on to the Board of Supervisors. We, we receive several of these types of complaints or concerns. Vicki Winters, your microphone is available. Hello, um, I wanted to uh, speak on uh, consent agenda item number 24, which I understand has been pulled. Um, and thank you, Supervisor Caput, for doing that. Um, and I just want to advocate that you take the steps that are outlined to make the um, online notification system for pesticide application, that you take leadership on this and uh, follow the recommendations of the grand jury to make that um, system available to all Santa Cruz County residents. And I know um, and I also want to thank you for your leadership on following the science um, and protecting our school children and county residents from COVID. Um, and I just want you to take that same type of leadership to implement this online notification system for pesticides. Thank you. Vicki Shepard, your microphone is available. Thank you. This is Vicki Shepard, and I live out in the um, the district that Zach Friend oversees. And I'm hoping that regarding item number 26, a cannabis item, that as we start to have more in-depth conversations about how this is affecting our neighborhoods, we really take in consideration 
an evaluation of the existing farms that are mostly out in our district. Um, and there, in our particular neighborhood, we have about 50 homes in its a bowl, um, it's sort of a, a little valley right along the ocean with a lot of uh, wildlife. And there has just been a permit pulled for that particular um, far, uh, the farm that's in the middle of that bowl. So we literally, most of the properties, many of them look down into that farm. Um, we have, uh, my concern is that there is, has, as far as I know, no process where there's an environmental study of what would happen to that area if a cannabis farm was allowed to go there. There are not only 50 homes in that area, that most of which look down into that valley or that bowl. Um, we, we maintain our own roads. There's also a, a, a school that's adjacent to that farm. And I'm concerned about the lack of transparency. We just learned about this permit being pulled, even though um, we've been very aware of the possibility of some changes since there's been a lot of activity on the farm, including what um, appears to be you know, preparing the greenhouses for some modifications and reconstruction. So our concern in the neighborhood is about traffic and our concern is about the lives and the children, uh, the people that are going to be affected. Dahlia Epperson, your microphone is available. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm speaking on the mandates, uh, both the vaccination mandates that you're looking at and also the mask mandates of the schools, but the vaccination mandates, uh, forced mandates, first of all, why? I just have to, it, the question begs because anybody who chooses to get the vaccination is going to be vaccinated, there's no problem. So when you say it's for public safety, it actually doesn't make sense. Those who want to get vaccinated, they'll get vaccinated. They're good to go. No problem. Those who do not want to get vaccinated, hey, they take the risk of being unvaccinated. So what public safety are you referring to and how does that play into public safety? It just doesn't make sense. Also, forced mandates. Uh, this, is, this violates all 10 points of the Nuremberg Code. It violates people's rights to medical privacy and it violates people's rights to choose what medical service is best for their body. Now, I have a medical uh, background. I was an LVN, I'm retired now. And if you go to the VAERS website, V-A-E-R-S, it shows the deaths from COVID vaccinations. And we're talking about 12,791 deaths. And please realize the swine flu vaccination or the swine flu shot, in 1976, uh, that was halted only after 32 deaths. So again, this whole thing about mandates, unethical, it goes against our rights. We should always have the choice. That is the American way. So reconsider and do not force any mandates, especially for something like this. It's already caused over 12,000 deaths. And that is on the VAERS public website. Thank you. Michael, your microphone is available. Good morning, supervisors. Um, I just want to speak this morning very briefly about an, um, an issue that you've heard uh, two pre previous speakers um, speak about, and that is with regard to the non-retail commercial cannabis uh, operation that's planned in the middle of the neighborhood in the area just to the south of Op Aptos. Um, now, uh, this isn't in a an agricultural area that's away from neighborhoods um, that, that would have no impact on, on areas. This is, as you've heard, literally in the middle of a um, neighborhood with uh, 55 to 60 homes. Um, all the supervisors at this point, um, your offices or your staff have received letters and calls from, from our neighbors here with regard to concerns about um, this operation. So I'm not gonna belabor uh, the the concerns about it, but in broad strokes, we're talking about noise, we're talking about odor, we're talking about security, we're talking about light pollution. 
And I think that the, the current ordinance um, has to address those issues, begs the questions of, of why such an operation, and we're talking 22 greenhouses here, um, would be allowed to, to be licensed in the middle of a, of a residential neighborhood. The environmental impact and the consequences of the current county uh, ordinance that allows an operation like this in the middle of a neighborhood with, with families in it um, is, is um, especially obvious to those who, who join that neighborhood or join that operation and would be looking down on it. So I, I, you know, like the previous speakers, I just really urge the supervisors to take in consideration and amend the current ordinance to prevent the placement of these kinds of businesses um, in these kind of neighborhoods. We have ample more remote locations that, that these operations can be successfully um, uh, carried out and, and um, meet the, the objectives of the county. Thank you. Hello, your microphone is available. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. My name is Mark Weller. I live in Santa Cruz and I'm a member of Safe Ag, Safe Schools. And my comments uh, regard item 24 D through F on the consent agenda. Uh, I'm very concerned that the board may, according to the staff report, ignore the Santa Cruz County Civil Grand Jury's recommendation to initiate a system of county online pesticide notification within six months and to work with other counties to push the state for a comprehensive statewide notification system. We know that three quarters of the more than a million pounds of pesticides applied in Santa Cruz County every year are so dangerous to our health that they are banned in at least six other countries of the world, many in dozens of countries of the world. But we find out three years after the fact when the state finally posts the information. We need to know ahead of time so we can take precautions, so we can close our windows, so we can keep sensitive people indoors, so we can avoid the areas of the applications. We also know that most of these pesticides are applied in South County, in Latinx majority areas. This is an example of environmental racism. Stop pesticide secrecy. Are five white guys going to ignore this issue? I trust not. Thank you. Kathleen Conley, your microphone is available. Kathleen Conley. Thank you, I needed to unmute. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kathleen Conley. I'm the Emergency Preparedness Manager for Public Health, which is a division of our health service agency. I come to this morning to um, the meeting to um, thank the board and support of the National Preparedness Month proclamation. National Preparedness Month was started um, a year after the tragic events of September 11th as we're coming up on the uh, 20th year anniversary of that tragic event. It causes us to reflect on our own personal family preparedness and the work that we are doing in our county to build resilience and to ensure that the whole community is ready for any type of emergency disaster of any type of hazard. I would also like to commend um, my colleagues and peers and all of the people in our community who have worked so hard um, since the start of this pandemic to save lives. And finally, um, I would also like to note that um, Santa Cruz County, along with two other counties in the state of California, were noted in today's New York Times for our high vaccination rates and the success that we have had, which is a whole community effort. So again, um, thank you for your support. For National Preparedness Month, and we encourage all of our community members to really think about and to plan your personal and family preparedness as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, we have three last callers. That was it. We have three callers left. Oh, three. 
Call in user one, your microphone is available. As a reminder, it is star six to unmute your phone. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and I want to thank uh, the previous speakers, except for the last one. <laughs> and I have a book in front of me called The Contagion Myth. Why viruses, including coronavirus, are not the cause of disease. And the book explores theories of how disease actually spreads. And um, the book has citations of how illness has followed 5G installation in all the major cities in America with some 5,000 towns and cities now covered. And the symptoms of radiation poisoning from 5G are the same as the symptoms listed for COVID-19. In Europe, illness is also highly correlated with 5G rollout. And a study of a Spanish epidemiologist has charted the rollout of 5G uh, in many, many countries and states that demonstrates a clear and close relationship between the rate of coronavirus infections and 5G and antenna locations. The inside cover of the book asks, are there really such things as viruses or are electrosmog toxic living conditions and 5G actually to blame for COVID-19? And I would like the board to stop any 5G installations. And I would like to know where Kathleen and Woody, your microphone is unavailable. Am I unmuted now? This is Kathleen Kilpatrick. I'm a resident of uh, Watsonville, a retired school nurse and uh, uh, trained as a nurse practitioner in occupational and environmental health. And uh, I live in the senior neighborhood close to the uh, fields. And uh, I want to thank Supervisor Caput for pulling. Uh, that uh, rubber stamp of the um, Agricultural Commissioner's response to the grand jury report um, from the agenda, I believe we all in our group that have worked on these issues believe this requi uh, requires a lot more examination and further discussion. And we really urge the other supervisors to meet with us uh, not just sending their, their staff, but themselves so that we can clarify some of the misperceptions both in the grand jury report and in uh, Juan Hidalgo's response. And I was really concerned that uh, everything in the supervisor's report that was presented to them to approve was pretty much a rubber stamp of what um, our Ag Commissioners uh, put in his report. and. Then when you get to the end, not even uh, being willing to take on an advocacy role for our uh, for this issue at the state level, which other elected officials have done, our uh, Watsonville City Council and school board and other city councils. And uh, there's no harm in saying uh, we're going to put our power behind the, um, reinforcing the right to know of our citizens. Uh, so that they can reduce exposure to the most toxic pesticides that are being applied in large quantities in our county and all over our state and our country. So um, let's keep talking about this. Uh, we have more work to do and we do have friends who can help. Milkbuck Collective, your microphone is available. Please state your name at the beginning of your comment. Yeah, good morning. Uh uh, chair and uh, board of supervisor, my name is Bernie Gomez with Milpa, and I'm, you know, I want to say thank you to uh, Mr. Uh, Kaput. Um, I hope I said I uh, pronounced your last name correct. Uh, um, but 
for moving the item 24 onto the agenda. This is another, uh, you know, conversation that needs to uh, not just be had, but there's need to be direct action taken upon, right? Uh, the truth is that our families, you know, our elderly, our youth, uh, our students, you know, they deserve to be protected, safe, you know, from these harmful pesticides. You know, uh, some might, some might, you know, the Ag Commissioner, he's, uh, really uses the whole, you know, like my hands are tied, but uh, uh, I have my hands tied, I can't do anything, right? But the truth is, you know, the, the sense of advocacy that he can uh, really push for, right? It's not there. So we need someone that's actually, you know, willing to take initiative and, and realize that these are really harmful, these are harmful, harmful factors that are affecting our communities, our families, right? So I just asked the board too, to uh, understand that, yes, Watsonville, you know, it's 84% brown. Uh, a, most, a lot of that population works in the fields. We do have, uh, home, you know, uh, elderly residents, you know, uh, residency uh, right next to some of the fields, right? Mackenzie Park area, Bridget Street area. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Lake, uh, Lakeview School right next to some fields, right? There's, you know, fields all around. So uh, I just urge this board to, you know, to... Uh, to also adhere to and and support the city council of Watsonville and the uh, uh, PBUC board, just like the previous speaker said, you know they they uh, they actually uh, um, recognize that this is uh, uh, something that needs to happen, and they they supported uh, previous uh, community engagements, right? And they've been able to they were willing to sit down with the community and, and speak on this. Uh, but understanding that that's not their uh, uh, jurisdiction, so that's why I'm here and urging the board to make this happen. You know, it, it's low cost. It's uh, you know, and even if it wasn't, you know, this still is, this is the the safety and security right of people's health. You know, and that should be first and foremost on top of the uh, your uh, agenda to secure these. Uh, uh, you know, my family that they work in the fields. You know, so with that being said, thank you for the time, and uh, I hope uh, everything goes well at that. Uh, further uh, meeting. Thank you. Chair, there are no other speakers and there are no speakers in the atrium. Okay. Uh, we'll return it to the board for comments on the consent agenda, recognizing that item 26 has been moved to 8.1. That's the cannabis quarterly report. And item 24 has been moved to 12.1. That's the grand jury report uh, discussion. I'll start with um, super, the first supervisor, uh, supervisor number one. Uh, any comments on the consent agenda, Mr. Uh, supervisor Koenig? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, on item 24, the release of the broadband RFP, I just wanna say I'm very excited to see this moving forward. Uh, since taking office, I've heard from a lot of Santa Cruz Mountain residents who feel isolated, disconnected, uh, and generally frustrated by their inability to have access to, to fast internet service in, over the last year and a half. Uh, and I hope that this half a million dollars that the board has allocated for broadband uh, will connect more people going forward. Uh, and that we can also uh, take advantage of more federal and state funds coming available for this purpose. On item 45, I just wanna congratulate the Health Services Agency on receiving this $4 million uh, grant for uh, children's and students' mental health services. It's gonna make a huge difference uh, and also address some of the needs we've seen, uh, again, coming out of the pandemic for more mental health services for students. On item 47, uh, the submission of the local area management plan. Uh, I just thank you to the Environmental Health Department for all the work they've put into this and the extensive public comment uh, reviewed and integrated. Uh, it, it's good that there is finally a time in the near future when our county will again be able to permit uh, and review advanced treatment systems. Do I hit that? I, I do anticipate a longer discussion about this when we consider the ordinance updates themselves, uh, include those that are outside of the state requirements, uh, including uh, evaluation at the time of property transfer. And I also think that we need to, uh, as a board, work on affordable alternatives like composting toilets because Ultimately, increased requirements for advanced septic systems uh, without affordable alternatives will simply lead to increased non-compliance. And finally, on item 57, um, for the accepting bid results for the Live Oak Branch Library project, uh, you know, the bid came in a little bit more than expected, but I'm still excited to see this project moving forward. It's within our budget for Measure S. And again, a big thank you to voters for approving Measure S. Uh, this will um, ultimately construct new electrical lighting, carpet, and updates to the children's area at the Live Oak Branch Library that uh, will be much appreciated. That's all my comments. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Second District Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a few items I'd like to comment on. First item 22, I just wanted to compliment staff. There's a wide variety of items here that we're applying uh, for this consideration with CSAC, the creative items, as well as it just shows the general leadership within the county. I hope that some of these are selected. We definitely deserve statewide recognition for the hard work for our county staff, and we've received a lot of it in the past. So I appreciate the application and consideration. On item 23, the redistricting item, uh, again, a great appreciation to not just the committee that was created, but uh, Ms. Benson and others in the CAO's office have been working to make this happen on a very condensed timeline. I would just like to encourage some of the outreach to expand a little bit beyond what was proposed to some of the secondary local papers, like say, for example, the Scotts Valley Times or the Aptos Times, for example, and some of the neighborhood associations just to make sure that that outreach can happen. Since there aren't outreach events per se or com committee hearings in every district, I think it would be important that we also reach some of those neighborhood-based uh, organizations in a different way to let them know they can participate virtually in some of these meetings. On item 29, uh, uh, great appreciation to our CAO and county staff in general on the remote work policy. It's very forward thinking. Um, there aren't very many uh, public agencies that are taking this much of a leadership role on this. It, it really does uh, work on, equ on equity, the environment, and the economy as far as um, it'll really bring services uh, or help allow people to work remotely, but also um, anybody that's been sitting on Highway 1 in the last couple months knows that any time that we can take some of those cars off is the second largest employer in the county that'll make a di big difference. And there's a pure economic effect on people not having to do the commute as well, on child care costs, et cetera. So I think it really is a very forward-thinking policy, and I'm glad to see that we're moving even more forward on it. On item 34, um, I, I def definitely appreciate uh, Supervisor Coonerty um, and myself had brought forward this item, and I appreciate the board's support of it, and also the work of Mr. Bowling and others in ISD to continue this process. I see this as a model that we can use should there be additional state or federal funding coming through and infrastructure packages. There was a pretty significant uh, $6 billion package in the state that we that hopefully this money, or excuse me, this process could also be used to help create that process. I mean, there's a lot of communities, not just in the first district, but as well in uh, the second and fourth, and well, I, I would say the fifth and actually third while we're at it, that, that it's one of these rural areas that are really touched by lack of broadband access. It was really obvious during the pandemic, but also even recently, as people still continue to use telemedicine, just having access as a, as a real fundamental infrastructure issue, and this is a good first step toward it. On the last two items, on item 50, just appreciation for IHSS. I mean, anybody, um, we, we really should take more time to really appreciate those that work in, in home supportive services, and, and uh, I'm really glad to see that we're finally able to help with the pay situation. A lot of appreciation both to our human services team, but as well as, as Ms. Patel and the personnel department to really make sure that this happened. But at the end of the day, those workers are doing work um, that many people aren't willing to do, and it really makes differences in people's lives. It's, it's really unmatched, so a great appreciation to those workers that do that. And the last but not least on item 54, Hidden Beach. This is very exciting to uh, see additional funds coming in this way and to have that groundbreaking coming up soon and uh, to honor uh, Jet Ramsey for this park and to see so many members of the community help fund this. I mean, the county did our job, uh, both uh, Mr. Palacios was supportive of the board's interest in funding this, as was uh, Mr. Gaffney, but to have this much community support shows that we can really reach out to the community to help fund these things. It's the largest investment in that, in that playground in, in that park in a generation. I'm looking forward to seeing it come to reality. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize my comments were a little bit long, but I appreciate the opportunity. Third District Supervisor Ryan Coonerty. Sure, I'll be brief. There's just two items, uh, and Supervisor Friend just mentioned both of them. Um, item number 29, which is our remote work policy, I think is a fantastic uh, approach, and uh, I'm very supportive of it, and um, for all the reasons that Supervisor Friend mentioned, and and uh, and, and frankly, as a way to recruit talent to the county um, that maybe we otherwise couldn't compete for. Uh, and so uh, the only thing I'd like to add is I'd like to get additional direction to come back at budget time and hear how that policy is working in practice and how many, um, how it's going in terms of those economic indicators in terms of keeping people off the roads and, um, and keeping people uh, retained or attracted to, to work at San in Santa Cruz County. And then um, on item number 50, as Supervisor Friend says, uh, these in-home in supportive uh, healthcare workers are are doing really incredible work. That's not only 
benefits um, their their clients, but also benefits society as a whole, uh, keeping people out of uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, and other costly alternatives, keeping people in their homes, uh, leading uh, quality, you know, uh, more improved quality of life. Um, and I'm very happy and appreciate the personnel uh, and HSD's work uh, to reach a contract and to get more money um, into the pockets of these people doing this this really incredible work for 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 their clients and for our community. Uh, Fourth District Supervisor Greg Caput. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I'll make my comments on uh, the two items that were pulled and. Uh, I agree with that. When we pull, discuss those items, don't yeah. that be the proper yeah. time? I don't know if there's anything else on the consent agenda. No, everything else has been uh, mentioned. Uh, item 50, I want to thank uh, in, in home uh, health services also. Thank you. I have a couple um, that I would like to uh, mention. Uh, item number 22, the CSAC Challenge Award nominations. I want to congratulate the uh, county staff who worked uh, on projects that have been nominated for Challenge Award with the California State Association of Counties. Uh, uh, thank all the staff for all the work that has done for these projects. Uh, we have received uh, statewide awards and recognition before. I surely do hope and expect we will do the same this time. Uh, on item 23 that's been mentioned, uh, I want to ensure the public knows about the redistricting process. It only happens once a decade, but um, this year will be happening very quickly because of the delayed census that took place. And so I want to thank the members of the redistricting commission and the staff who are working under that timeline to bring back the plan to the board for approval in December. And that means that um, those sessions will probably be starting in uh, the early part of September. Uh, we needed to get it back to the board by mid-December for final action. Uh, this is the redistricting process that um, really draws our county supervisor lines. Uh, so people should be aware that that is going to be a quick but uh, upcoming process. And we are going to have meetings throughout the county for people to comment on those. Um, also, I want to mention on 20, uh, no, item number 24, the broadband. Um, as was mentioned by Supervisor Koenig, this is very uh, critical for us. If uh, we have been working to expand in this county and this state has, and I, I think uh, as, as I, as a member of CSAC, or the, uh, have been pushing for this, as has uh, Supervisor Friend on the National Association of Counties, NACO, to uh, expand this. It would have helped us immensely in this very, uh, recent fire crisis that we had. But uh, we, we're really excited about the, the prospect of having more people have more communications in those types of uh, crises. Um, the, uh, on uh, the uh, item number um, 39, the real estate fraud program, uh, under the district attorney, I want to thank uh, district attorney Jeff Rozell and his staff for the real estate fraud, fraud program. Very much, much a concern, it's very, been very successful. I'm especially concerned about fraud especially towards senior citizens who are among the most vulnerable in these trying times. And on item 47 that has been mentioned, the local area management plan or LAMP, um, the recently retired John Ricker would like to love to see that this is finally getting uh, underway. I'm glad we're on track to get this report approved. It's been a long time in the making uh, and it will be a good to have local management again on this issue to reduce the time it takes for approval. And I want to thank the environmental health team for their efforts on putting this plan together and implementing it into the future so we can have a, a very, very, uh, very more environmentally sensitive uh, county throughout uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, with that, um, I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda as uh, with the two directions to uh, delay uh, Item 26 to 8.1 and item 24 to 12.1. I'll move the consent agenda with the additional direction. Second. Second. Second by Coonerty. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Supervisor Caput. there. Supervisor McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with attendance. Okay. 
Supervisor Caput, did you hear that? Did you get his vote? I'm sure he voted yes, but. He has not responded, so four uh, one. Okay. Yes, no, thank fine. you. Very good. Okay, no, very no, good. Sorry. Very good, thank you. We will move to uh, item number uh, seven on the regular agenda. To, excuse me, to consider the adoption of a resolution confirming the issuance of one or more series of pension obligation bonds to refinance the outstanding obligations of the county to the California Public Employees Retirement System with respect to the county's safety plan and safety sheriff plan, approving and directing related matters as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. We have a resolution authorizing the issuance of the POBs, uh, indenture of trust, chart one of safety plans, chart two of safety plans, uh, table three estimated POB savings, preliminary official statement, bond purchase agreement, and pension liability uh, management possibility. And Marcus uh, Pimentel, our finance manager, will be presenting this. Turn, turn that on and pull it no closer to you. That little button on. Thank you, my apologies. Nope. Uh, good morning, Chair McPherson and our board of supervisors. I am, uh, as you announced, I am your county budget manager and I'm presenting today's item on con our concluding actions to issue our pension obligation bonds. Uh, in this hybrid presentation, we have two of our team members here virtually with us, uh, Suzanne Harold of Harold & Associates. She's been our, our county's longtime municipal advisor and our bond counsel, Juan Galvin from Jones Hall. They're here in, in this space. So if we have questions and we need their support, they'll be here and available. Uh, as you recall, a primary objective of this project has been to stabilize our future payments and cash flows. In addition, we wanted to reduce our risks as well as increase the funded level of our pension plans, especially our inner safety plans. We expect to recycle some of these pension obligation bond savings to reduce future pension obligation costs. So it's an important part of our future solutions to bridge our gaps. Uh, today's actions, as you already outlined, will direct staff to finalize the pension obligation bond issuance process that was approved on May 11th, authorized on May 11th, 20, 2021. And we want to provide an update on the changes since May 11th. Um, some of those we'll be talking about here in a few seconds. And finally, we wanted to include, conclude with what we told you we'd come back with some best, best practices policy on managing and developing plans to reduce future pension uh, liabilities. In this board agenda item, we've linked this to our May 11th report since that report contained a lot of detailed, um, substantial information and attachments that help talk about pension obligation bonds, their opportunities, their risks, and the, the thinking that went behind today's uh, actions. The process as you've been familiar with, we began uh, informally in April 15th, we presented this to the county's debt advisory committee. They unanimously approved the moving forward with the issuance of, of pension obligation bonds. On May 11th, this board authorized us to continue actions, including a validation action towards the issuance of pension obligation bonds for our safety plans. We concluded that validation action in July uh, on August 16th, we uh, had a very successful rating review by standards and pours. And today we are concluding actions and we expect to close these bonds by September 21st and likely earlier than that. Now, just recapping some of the highlights that have um, changed since May, I am happy to report that we are still projecting well north of $60 million of savings over the life of these bonds, uh, $61.3 million and happy to report that our bond interest rate is reduced from a projected 3% down to 2.4%. That is largely due to the confidence and trust the market and our rating agencies have in this board, its actions, the county leadership and the prior uh, conservative and very prudent fiscal management of the county. Uh, we do expect that the total issuance will be reduced to 124 million from 140 million. That is largely, re that reduction is largely attributed to the reduction in the interest rate and CalPERS. CalPERS, as you know, the stock market in March of 2020 collapsed mightily after the pandemic. CalPERS investments lost substantially in the end of that year. They've recovered a lot of that market and one of the offs, uh, one of the opportunities that came out of that is they funded, they increased the funding level of our plans, which reduced our liability. So the reduced interest rate plus some of the CalPERS earnings that, earnings that reduced our liability allowed us to target a lower funding level of our debt. With that 21.3% investment rate of return by CalPERS, it triggered a reduction in their discount rate. Their discount rate is what they project for future investments, but it's also the rate they charge us on their debt issuance, on their debt service costs. So that reduced from 7% to 6.8%. Uh, 
as you might recall, we modeled scenarios that were what would happen if CalPERS reduced the late all the way, rate all the way down to 6%. And in those models, we were still achieving savings of $40 million. So we anticipated a reduction in the rate. This doesn't surprise us. And there could still be some more future uh, modest rate reductions. And overall, our savings is still projected at $61.3 million over the life of the bonds. We both jumped ahead. Uh, this is just a recap, a brief recap of the proposed financing structure. Most of the bonds will go towards increasing our fund level of our safety plans from 67% to 90%. There is a portion of the bond proceeds because we wanted to avoid double payments. Um, we will have new debt service that starts this year and we would be paying our existing debt service to CalPERS. We're using some of the debt proceeds to pay CalPERS in advance. So we're, we're, we're not double paying on our debt. Um, Otherwise, just recapping that we, uh, with this action, we'll be increasing our investment, our, our funded level of plans up to 90%, and we're very happy to, to do that. Included with today's actions that we discussed in May was is the inclusion of a, of, a, of a debt management policy that really is about when we come back to the board with future plans and um, one of those is by way of example is what what would happen if our 90% funded level of our safety plans dropped uh, dropped in the future down to below 85% that would trigger us from coming back to the board with a plan to return that to 85% or higher. In addition, we want to come back to the board later this fiscal year with a with a funding target for our other pension obligation liabilities and a plan towards how we reduce our miscellaneous plan that you might recall that is a big portion of our liabilities, but there's some uh, still some issues that we were resolving with the superior courts and some other issues before we come back to that. But we want to come back to the board with how we reduce those liabilities and increase our savings in the future. So this is, um, we're really happy to bring this forward. It's a best industry practice and it was supported by S&P. With that, we get to our concluding actions. Um, or I, I should also pause for a second. And we always forget to thank ourselves. And I want to thank this board and our CAO, Carlos Palacios. We've had an outstanding team put this together. Um, they've been working on this for quite a long time, including Christina Mowry, our current county budget manager, Edith Driscoll, our elected county auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. They've been very instrumental in this, as has Jason Heath in returning hundreds of pages of review in a, an amazing time. Um, so he's been phenomenal. We've had a very um, thoughtful, um, candid debt advisory committee who looked at this very closely. And we've been supported by a lot of extremely important debt subject matter experts, including Suzanne Harold and Joan, Jones Hall, Wong Galvin, who are here with us today, but also Gov and Best. Uh, we've worked with CalPERS. They've been very generous with their time. And our new underwriter, Steve and Nicholas and Bank of America Securities, they've been very helpful with validating some of our some of our projections. So we've had a very strong team and I'm proud of this team and I'm proud of the work that we've accomplished. So with that, we get to the concluding actions and ending this portion of the presentation to uh, confirm the issuance of one or more of the series of our pension obligation bonds towards the goal of refinding, refunding, refinancing these outstanding obligations and approving the pension management policy as outlined here on the slide for you. With that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I and I know Suzanne and Juan are available for any questions uh, you might have. Thank you. Thank you, and, and again, welcome uh, Marcus Pimentel as our finance manager for the county. A very well done. Uh, overall, this is gonna save us $2 million. And I think it all also signifies, as you st stated early on in your statements, the value we have in the county to have a, an adequate reserve that's recognized by the financial markets. And uh, we're gonna get back there. Uh, it's been a rough go, as we know, for one reason or another, COVID fires, whatever the case. But uh, the value of having an adequate reserve is, uh, is really, really important. And this shows the success of that. Um, I will, I'm going to go to comments from the board. Uh, I'll start with Supervisor Friend, District 2. Any comments? I think, Mr. Chair, I don't have any specific comments other than appreciation on this. This is something we had a very extensive discussion about some months back. And, and as you noted, it does save a significant amount of money. I, I mean, there are some idiosyncrasies with the CalPERS process and the way that they calculate uh, returns and such. But with that said, this is a very responsible thing to do moving forward and also puts future boards in a much better situation from a financial standpoint than, than the situation that we had inherited previously. So I think that this is a very responsible action for future boards as well. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to take a moment to um, thank staff, <clears throat> recognize previous county leadership who uh, who built a solid uh, financial reserve that uh, allows us to take advantage of these record low interest rates um, to lock in um, to lock them in for the foreseeable future and reduce our uh, liabilities. I think this is a smart move, and I want to thank everyone who's been involved in the effort. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick comment that, uh, yeah, we did inherit uh, uh, the huge uh, pension problems that we have today. Uh, that all started, a lot of it started in the uh, 1990s, and uh, uh, we're having to deal with it. So uh, hopefully when we're done, the, the ones that replace us in the future will not have to uh, not have as big a problem as we're having right now. Thank you. And Mark, how are you doing, by the way? He's doing fine. Good. Supervisor Koenig. Good. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I just also want to express my thanks to Budget Manager Pimentel and all the staff who's, who have worked on this. Uh, you know, the, the county is actually a little bit ahead of the games than some of the other agencies out there. I know there is going to be competition uh, when uh, issuing these bonds. And so uh, our, the, the quick work is allowing us to take advantage of the opportunity and also the sound fiscal management uh, getting us to this point is allowing us to get to uh, this fantastic interest rate. So just my deep thanks and appreciation. Okay. Uh, are there any comments from the public? There's none here. Uh, any virtual or? One speaker online. Caller 2915. Your microphone is available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I am also glad to see that this uh, lower interest rate money is being secured by the county. But I question why there is no... Um, additional payment being made to pay down this debt uh, when the county has the money. This is a tactic that the um, Aptasasaba Fire District has been doing for the last, oh, I'll say three or four years. They're making double payments. And um, that is a wise use of money. So when the county has the extra funding, such as now, I mean, there was a, a budget surplus reported, I believe, due to all of the federal funding. Why don't we use some of that to pay down the debt so that it is less of a burden? That makes financial sense and what most of us try to do in paying our mortgages. Thank you very much. There are no other speakers and there are no speakers in the atrium. Okay. Um, I will return it to the board. I don't know if you had any further comments, Mr. Pimentel. Um, entertain a motion by the board. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second uh, Supervisor Caput. Okay. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. C. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we will go to item number eight. Um, this is, um, excuse me, here, to consider uh, an ordinance amending chapter 7.130 of the Santa Cruz County Code relating to cannabis dispensary siting criteria, uh, setback waivers, and schedule the ordinance for a second reading and a final adoption on September 14th, 2021. As outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer, we have the 7.130.110E code amendment and the Santa Cruz County Code 7.130 uh, red line. Uh, we also, um, we will take up this item as number eight and uh, as was requested by Supervisor Friend, uh, we will discuss uh, number 26 separately, but uh, we'll go with this report first. Good morning, everyone. At the October 6th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, staff presented a summary of the cannabis licensing official's authority and options for including the public in decision making. The board made a motion that the cannabis licensing office official's decisions related to cannabis retailers seeking a setback waiver include a public notice and appeal procedure. We're here today to review the um, proposed amendments to the ordinance. Uh, 
Stephanie's struggling here. The wheel's not working. Sorry. Um, there you go. The toilet slide. Uh, we should be on public. Setting criteria public. Next slide. Yeah. Um, thank you. The public notice discussed with the board included notification to the public within 600 feet of a parcel. While attempting to fulfill the board's motion, staff has proposed we notify all owners within 600 feet and all lawful tenants within 100 feet. This was not identified in the board motion, but follows the current planning department policies for public notification associated with development permits. In addition to this notification to the lawful tenants within 100 feet, staff has also included posting a notification on the property which aligns with current planning department policies. Um, with regard to appeal procedures, the procedures proposed include allowing appeals by any person. Any appeal would result in a stay in the issuance of a cannabis business license. And upon receipt of an appeal or appeals, the matter will be heard de novo by an administrative hearing officer. The administrative hearing officer would be required to render a decision within 30 days. That would be final, as specified um, by the board in their motion. Questions with regard to these changes? Okay. Um, well, thanks again um, to the uh, cannabis licensing office for bringing this to the board, uh, and as well as the past modifications that um, to our ordinances to improve the processes. Um, I just want a question. Um, how many potential potential licensees uh, would this apply to now if approved? And what level of compassionate care would future applicants need to demonstrate uh, in order to be eligible? Um, as it currently stands, uh, based on our review, only two of our current retailers meet the criteria for being approved for their compassionate care component of their business. Okay. And we'll go to the uh, the board. I'll open it up with uh, Supervisor uh, Coonerty. Any questions on item number eight? Not at this time. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, Supervisor Caput, this is on item number eight, not item 26. So any questions on item number eight? Thank you, Supervisor Caput. You are muted. I'll, I'll wait uh, for item 26. Supervisor uh, Koenig. No questions, thank you. Questions? Uh, any, any questions from the public here? Downstairs or on the? There are no speakers for Zoom or in the atrium. Okay. We will uh, return it to the board for action. Mr. Chair, this is uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, first, I'll just a very brief comment of appreciation, Mr. Forty. This was my uh, requested additional direction. I appreciated the board's approval of this. I think this is a very reasonable approach and I also appreciate County Council's quick work on this. I will move the recommended actions. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Okay, now we will go to item number 20, um, or 8.1, which was item 26 on the consent agenda. And uh, let's see, let me get this back here. This is uh, to accept and file a fourth quarter and annual report for fiscal year 2020-21 on Cannabis Licensing Office operations, direct staff to return on or before October 19th, 2021 with the first quarter report for fiscal year 2021-22 and schedule a public hearing on November 9th, yeah. 2021 to address ordinance changes as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. Um, would you be presenting this again? Yes, sure. I will. Okay, go ahead, please. For last fiscal year, um, our retail system remained stable. Uh, specifically in the fourth quarter, uh, we still have 12 retailers. Um, two retailers received conditional licenses in the third quarter to allow time to coordinate license modifications with the state. Uh, that has been completed and both know, now have annual licenses. Uh, with regard to taxes, we received over $3.1 million in retail CBT, which is a 16.8% increase over last fiscal year. 
On the non-retail front, I'll be presenting updates on key areas of interest previously identified by the board. With regard to licensing, 66 licenses have been issued as of the end of the fiscal year. Six licenses were in review. Of the 66 current licenses, 30 are a direct result of code modifications. 38 use permit applications have been submitted. Um, several of those submittals were delayed um, due to COVID-related closure of public counters. Um, but as of the end of the fiscal year, 26 use permits have been approved and seven are no longer being pursued. Oh, come on. Um, compliance activities for the fourth quarter in the year. Um, compliance inspections have remained steady with approximately 60 sites being inspected um, last quarter, not including our follow-up inspections. We have seen an uptick in non-compliant activity with our operators, mainly focused on our new operators. Um, this has led to the issuance of five notices of violation last quarter, which resulted in two operations um, being closed, one licensee and one operator with a local letter of, or a, a LOLA. For um, annual compliance activities, as part of the year-end summary, I wanted to highlight how the CLO code compliance efforts complement the Sheriff's Office enforcement efforts. The Sheriff served 96 search warrants last year and code compliance staff issued 59 uh, notices of violation with, uh, associated with those search warrants. In this work, code compliance staff evaluate unpermitted and substandard work as part of issuing the NOVs um, 19 sites were deemed an immediate public safety hazard and power was disconnected to some or all of the properties to mis mitigate hazards identified by code compliance staff. Thank you. Um, activities within the C&M zones um, is limited to a total of 100,000 square feet. There are currently eight properties pursuing cannabis activities within these districts. There is currently one property within the C&M zones uh, still building out to meet their use permit conditions of approval. And uh, a second, which is applying for building permits to meet their licensing requirements. Of the remaining six properties, five have licenses and the sixth is pending. Um, the total potential canopy within these buildings could be approximately 12,000 square feet. Of note, only three of the eight sites within these zones plan on cultivation. Uh -oh. So with regard to non-retail taxes, we received nearly $3.1 million in non-retail CBT. This was $1.4 million over budget and represented a 95.8% increase from last fiscal year. The main driver of the increased non-retail CBT revenues um, for last fiscal year was uh, primarily an increase in licensed operators. Enforcement activities remain steady overall for the year, even though the sheriff's team were reassigned during the CZU lightning complex fire last year. Enforcement activities have identified more indoor cannabis cultivation activity associated with power theft than in previous years. This year's Activity included the seizure of 59 firearms, which was an increase of 32 firearms versus the previous year. Now, the amount of processed cannabis seized decreased substantially by over 7,000 pounds, but the amount of cannabis um, extract increased by over 700 pounds this year. Uh, the labs identified by the sheriff's office, the sheer amount of them has remained steady, um, but the size and scope of lab operations this year was greater than in years past. Um, there have been numerous changes at the state level this year that I wanted to highlight to the board, and those changes include an appellations program, um, so cannabis cultivators can identify where their cannabis is grown, and an organic equivalence program. Uh, the most substantial changes that have occurred at the state level are focused on the consolidation of the state agencies. There were three licensing agencies that have consolidated into the Department of Cannabis Control. Um, the Department of Cannabis Control has completed a, a superficial revision of state regulations to reflect this consolidation effort, but this year we do expect significant revisions to reflect the streamlining efforts that the DCC is currently making. Uh, 
Sorry, I'm stuck, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so just a brief summary. 30 licenses have been issued based on the new regulations, 66 licenses total as of the end of the fiscal year. Um, enforcement activities have remained steady and staff is seeking to make additional non-substantive code modifications um, to clean up some issues with regard um, to technical issues in the code that, and, and I'd like to open it up to questions from the board. All right, thank you very much. I think we'd let, uh, open this up with Supervisor Friend who requested this to be pulled from the consent agenda. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the board for indulging this being pulled and also for Mr. Bill Forty for his work over the last year. Um, since uh, part of the reason why I was interested in pulling the item is because they're gonna be coming back in November with some uh, code modifications and I thought that it made sense to propose additional ones based on information that we've received over the last year. Um, as you know, uh, the, all these ordinances are meant to be iterative. We, we take sort of a yearly look at them or even a quarterly look at them to see whether they need to be modified. And we've made uh, innumerable modifications to them over the course of time. And I think that one of the things that needs to be uh, modified is in regards to the non-retail uh, ordinances. As you know, the board also had always focused on ensuring that all this activity not be in residentially zoned districts. Unfortunately, at least on the, on the non-retail side, uh, what we're finding is that a lot of this cultivation and manufacturing is actually occurring immediately adjacent to a residential parcel, which was, I think, outside of what the board's intent, intent always was and is having neighborhood-based impacts. Now, disproportionately, to be fair, this is occurring in my district with a little less so happening in Supervisor Koenig's district, but all the same, these impacts are, are very real and I think was outside of what the board's original intent was. Over the last year, I've had meetings with the Farm Bureau, I've had meetings with neighborhood associations, with community groups, um, even met extensive conversations with our great GIS team to look at maps to ensure that we weren't, that what we were considering proposing today for the board's consideration for a future uh, comeback ordinance revision uh, was really just to honor the board's intent and not to just simply remove the possibility of cultivation or manufacturing or any other non-retail activity. And I think that we've met a decent balance i also like to acknowledge that Mr. Laforte has volunteered a lot of his time to attend these community meetings virtually with us to answer a lot of questions from concerned community members as well as the Farm Bureau, and he's an outstanding resource for the county, and I've appreciated his time on that. Um, in particular, though, I think that what we need to do is have staff come back at that November date with some specific modifications to the ordinance. Uh, and some of these, by the way, mirror what we just adopted on the retail side. So such as a noticing community input and appealability factor, uh, that language just adopted on the dispensing side, on the retail side. And I think we should also have that on the non-retail side. And I think that we need to prohibit on the non-retail side, um, cultivation on CA property that's adjacent to residentially zoned districts plus a setback of 500 feet. So a valid question would be, well, how much does this impact? Well, it still maintains over 800 parcels for cultivation in the CA zones, but it provides these conflict, it eliminates these conflict points that occur uh, actually specifically in, in uh, the first, third and second districts where there are residentially zoned districts immediately adjacent to uh, commercial agricultural cultivation. And, and that is what has been leading to most of these complaints. Uh, as Mr. Laforte said, there's been a number of of compliance issues over the last year. Well, if you look at the stats, they're basically all within the second district and almost all of them are conflict points between residentially zoned areas and commercial agriculture. Uh, so to move forward on that, um, I'm, I'm prepared after public comment to make specific uh, a specific motion, but I'll, I'll daylight the additional issues that I have. I think that we should have a moratorium come back to the board on approval of any permits, just like we did on the vacation rental side. Uh, that would meet this criteria until the board can actually adopt an ordinance associated with this. So I'd be asking that that uh, we have a moratorium come back on these conflict point locations, uh, maybe September 14th, that the board can enact uh, in advance of, of the November action where the board can consider these changes. And lastly, I just would ask uh, Mr. Laforte and County Council to come back with information on current permit holders that might be in conflict with this zoning and setback concerns. I recognize that they have a permit 
Um, I don't know what the solution is on that, but just to kind of provide an understanding to the board of how many there are and ways that maybe we can mitigate or address those issues because that's where a number of those complaints are coming. I'll put that into a specific motion when it comes back or I'd be happy to answer any of my colleagues' questions or I'd be very welcome to hearing anybody from the community. Um, there, there, a few members did speak during public comment, as you know, I received sort of an innumerable number of letters in advance of that. The board received a, a number of them as well. Uh, so there is a lot of community interest in support of these actions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, so first, I think I want to start broadly by appreciating uh, Mr. Laforte and this report. Um, it's incredibly clear, outcome-driven, um, and by and large, really good news. Um, we moved from a place where uh, we were getting very few permits approved to where we now have an operating system. I appreciate both the, uh, the increase in um, business and tax revenue, but then also uh, the increased enforcement um, to ensure that the rules are being followed. Um, I thought it was a, a very good report and reflective of the very good work that the, that the cannabis licensing officer uh, is, has been engaged in and um, sort of a model for other priorities uh, for the county of how we can track and and see improvement and, and make changes as necessary. Uh, as uh, Supervisor Friend mentioned, we've gotten a lot of uh, letters and um, just had some comment this morning. And um, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Laforte to respond to some of the comments that were made this morning um, and how we try to balance, you know, uh, competing uses or needs uh, in this area. the public associated with the uh, Crest Drive area. I believe that's what all the speakers were discussing. Um, I think it actually exemplifies how the code works because those, um, those members of the public have been concerned. They've reached out to the office. They've reached out to Supervisor Friend's office. But that site in question actually would not qualify for a cannabis business license without going through the conditional use permit process. Due to its location to sensitive receptors, the school that was mentioned, there's also a state park in the area. So that would not um, be able to be licensed directly by the office. It would go through the same uh, development process as any other commercial use in the county. So I think it, it actually, the people's concerns make sense and they're very clear. They've articulated them super well, but the, the code actually captures it quite well by um, deferring any action to a conditional use permit, including a zoning administrator, public hearing and public notification. Um, so I believe there was a second question in there, Supervisor Coonerty, uh, about. Uh, no, no, I, okay. I wanna appreciate your work and I appreciate the clarity around what that particular parcel and the process that, um, the public process that will be uh, implemented in that area. Uh, I haven't, heard um, Supervisor Friend's additional directions yet, so I'll wait uh, and can respond to those. But overall, I just want to thank you for the report and uh, the work on both uh, the permit processing side to create jobs and tax revenue, but then also on the enforcement side to protect our, our environment and our neighborhoods. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've been getting phone calls also and uh, a uh, couple of letters, and uh, I could see that uh, the same problem we're having in this uh, supervisor friends area and others could be coming to the Watsonville area. I just wanted to say, from what I'm looking at on uh, number 26, it uh, it does allow for uh, uh, the review process. It does have uh, it states public input. And it also has the appeal uh, part of it. So uh, the whole thing comes down to um, we want to protect uh, residential ag areas uh, and uh, CA and residential uh, a lot of times come right next to each other. So it's a protection of neighborhoods and also um, 
the word compassion, uh, compassionate uh, cannabis growers and things like that. Uh, we need to show compassion to uh, residential areas that uh, in residential neighborhoods and uh, they they don't want a lot of changes uh, uh, they've been there for many years and uh, they have a great concern about uh, how the you know how cannabis uh, right next to their neighborhood uh, might uh, change the whole atmosphere of their neighborhood so anyway i i i agree with uh, uh, we need to look at this more and uh, I'll support uh, any motion to do that. Yes, uh, Supervisor Friend, you were going to make a motion. Okay, uh, we'll wait till we after we hear public comment. Return to the board. Uh, I, I I'm going to make a couple comments too. I. I'm impressed. Thank you, Mr. Fort, for the uh, to everything that you have done uh, to get us to this. Uh, Point. Uh, we've seen an increase in revenue and uh, law enforcement activity as uh, and I'm very concerned about uh, make, making sure that the compassionate care um, portion of this is, uh, is remains and I think it will uh, with any motion. Um, we worked a long time on this uh, over two years and we got to where we, uh, we are today and I think we have we have benefited from those those discussions. Uh, there's probably there's going to be more. It appears, and uh, so I I do uh, appreciate a new look at this under the circumstances, and um, just want to say thank you for your office and what you've accomplished. Uh, it's a you don't have a very big office at all, and uh, and for the law enforcement activity too that has taken place. Um, Supervisor Coney. Yes, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you also to Mr. Laforti for the great report and all your uh, work to improve the licensing operations in the county. I mean, it certainly shows in terms of some of the revenues we've started to see. I mean, nearly uh, $6 million to the positive, uh, $3 million from the retail space, and another $3 million from non-retail. Uh, and I think, you know, our, our county certainly uh, sorely needs that money in these trying financial times. Um, you know, I'll just echo what Supervisor Friend has said. I mean, certainly I've heard uh, concerns from residents within my own district, also having grown up on Browns Valley Road, which is uh, the site of one of the sites of concern. I've heard uh, a lot from former friends uh, or current friends and, and former neighbors there. Um, so I recognize the need to balance the interests of, of industry and residents. Um, I guess, you know, I'm, uh, later on in our agenda day on item 10, we're considering uh, the comprehensive economic development strategy, and it does talk about ag tech innovation. Um, and I think you know we, we have to include cannabis uh, as as a crop in in terms of ag tech innovation and potential for our community. Um, so um, you know we're, I'm I'm really interested as we move forward in understanding some of the impacts uh, that Supervisor Friend's proposals will have uh, on the industry. Uh, as well as um, you know, any ideas from uh, the Cannabis Licensing Office on how we can continue to support the industry in a responsible way. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go to the public. Are there any comments from the public? Let's see. Okay. Good morning. My name is James. Um, I'm kind of reminded of a tenant or a landlord that kind of put me in my place when I was renting from her in 2007. And she's like, you know, stoners come up with the best ideas in the world. They're just too stoned to do anything about them. Um, and I will think that, you know, the last time that cannabis came up when I actually was able to attend a city of Santa Cruz meeting, they went on for over two and a half hours. Um, you know, during this process, when everything got shut down, the liquor stores didn't get shut down and the cannabis dispensaries didn't get shut down and neither did any of the big corporations. So it's great that we're talking about cannabis, but if there were three things that could actually heal the world, it would be hemp and cannabis is part of hemp. During the Civil War, it was required that every farmer grow hemp, which is which is unheat activated cannabis. Um, so that's enough. I mean, I'm sitting here because I want to comment on, I believe, what is going to be 8.2, but I figured I'd put in my no, two It's going to be 12.1, but go ahead. 12.1? Uh, oh, number 26 is, uh, where was it? Number 24 is going to be 12.1. Uh, any other comments from the public? Yes, sir. Hi, 
Hi, I'm uh, Christopher Daly, and I've been a 47-year resident of Santa Cruz County, and I've been cultivating cannabis since I was 15 years old. And uh, when the, the sixth plant uh, limit was passed, I believe it was April 14th, 2020, uh, the word didn't get out to people. Uh, people in my neighborhood were growing 24 plants and uh, didn't know that it was down to six. And the sheriff's department came in and would take everything. Not let, you know, they could have left six plants. Uh, I believe that the way it is with law enforcement, it creates a dichotomy. It, it makes uh, growers and law enforcement, uh, creates hostilities between the two. And uh, it needs to be communicated, uh, you know, or, or the laws when they get passed, advertise so people know what's going on. You know, because uh, the way it is now, uh, when they fly over, you know, they could letter the people and say, hey, you have too many plants, you got to cut it down, you know, limited it to what it's supposed to be, instead of coming in and taking everything like that. Not, you know, uh, there needs to be a rapport between the cultivators and the constables. Because uh, the current, I, I've seen uh, some of the, uh, Sheriff's Department, some of the things that they've done to people, like drain their water tanks and, uh, you know, uh, it's just like the Sheriff of Nottingham, you know, we're going back in time. It's like going back to the camp years. That was a failed policy then, and it's failed policy now. History repeats itself, and we don't, we're smart enough to not go back in time. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any, anyone else would like to address us here, in the chamber? Do we have anybody uh, online? There is no one in the atrium. Just for the record, the atrium has been closed. Okay. There's caller 2915. Your microphone is available. How many callers do we have? We have three callers. Three. Okay. Thank you. Hello, this is Becky Steinberger. Can you hear me? Hello? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Supervisor Friend, for pulling this from the consent agenda. It really does merit discussion like what we're having now. And um, I note in Table 1 that District 3 has zero licenses. And I think that's a, a big disproportionate difference between, say, District 2 that has 28 licenses. District 1 that has 26 licenses. So I'm curious why District 3, Supervisor Coonerty's uh, district, has no licenses. And yet there, there is um, definitely corrective activity, enforcement activity going on there, even with the, the CZU fires happening, as is shown in Table 5, uh, notice of violations by Supervisor District. There were uh, a total of five violations in District 3. I am very curious and quite concerned by the information in Table 4, the cannabis enforcement activity, especially the number of firearms seized, 40 alone in the third quarter. Um, by the notice of violations um, in the District uh, Table 5, that looks like it could be um, mostly from the Supervisor Koenig's area, uh, where there were five actions. One action taken in, in the third quarter in District 3 and one action taken in District 4. So I am curious about this uh, level of weaponry that's coming into the um, cannabis areas. I'm grateful that the law enforcement is uh, finding it and seizing it. I've had a very large operation in conjunction with the BHO lab in my community and people had no idea it was. Chris Codria, your microphone is available. Hello, this is uh, Chris Kodiga. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my family owns the property at 224 Browns Valley in Coralitas. Um, we've been uh, uh, 
working with this issue since 2019. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Supervisor Friend um, for being um, so receptive to our, our neighbors and Coralitas. We have over 100 people who are involved in our group called the Coralitas Coalition for Balanced Land Use. Uh, I appreciate uh, with his recommendations, a 500 setback, a foot setback is good. Uh, the appeals process, we appreciate that. Uh, greenhouses, uh, I, we feel should be required uh, if you're going to do it uh, to limit the odor. The odor is terrible down there in, in our area. We're also very supportive of a mor moratorium as of uh, you know now on the licenses that are adjacent uh, to the to the residential zone type R R R A and R. Um, and also, I'd like to uh, raise the issue of enforcement. Right next to us at 196 Browns Valley, uh, there were people who had uh, felony uh, felon uh, had felonies that were able to get licenses. We don't know how this happened. We're worried about firearms. Also, um, the marijuana, uh, excuse me, the cannabis is not subject to the ag water runoff rules, which our little 10 acre organic apple orchard is. Uh, we're having major rodent problems because most of the land on cannabis grows is fallow. So we've had terrible gophers and now squirrels. And also, I just like to say that, you know, revenue is not the most important thing. And we just, I don't think you make enough money off having grows in small rural neighborhoods. So thank you very much. Vicki Shepard, your microphone is unmuted. Thank you for taking my call. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. I just want to thank Supervisor Friend and Caput for um, addressing this um, issue, the cannabis issue, um, again, and for the work that um, Sam is doing to um, really look at the um, community that I live in off of Crest and CV Terrace. But also, I want to say I had a long conversation with a, a longtime well-known farmer in the rural area of Watsonville that is, I, I believe, um, the, the district that um, Caput oversees. And I know that he has told me that there's three farms within his region and some of them you know, the glow in the night, and we're talking about environmental concerns. And I don't know that we've really addressed the lighting that happens from the greenhouses um, that really ruins the night sky. And I would love for this to be, um, you know, really looked at environmentally. And I know I'm not as articulate as some, but I just want to appreciate that you're taking time to look at this and um, take moratorium um, on these issues. Yeah. And different models that we've explored. Right. So I'm just I'm just gonna um, thank you again for stopping and taking a look at this, and thanks for your time. John Pizzini, your microphone is available. Thank you. Uh, I also want to uh, support the the board's review of the cannabis uh, cultivation regulations and support uh, and appreciate the attention that both the cannabis licensing officer and the and the supervisors have provided for the community um, in Coralitos. It's time to understand the impact that some of these cultivation grows have on residential communities and to review a better way to find a more balanced way to continue to support the cannabis industry within Santa Cruz County, but also support uh, the residents of Santa Cruz County and get and and make sure that we can uh, uh, provide the residents with um, uh, the ability to continue with uh, our way of life and the reason why we all love living in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Kathleen and Woody, your microphone is available. Uh, I did not really intend to speak on this topic. It just happened to uh, come across my, uh, yeah. Um, I just want to uh, speak up for Watsonville and downtown Watsonville. Uh, we have a lot of warehouses, um, some of which are empty. 
Uh, we have uh, farm workers who are changing occupations because if they work in the cannabis industry, the pay is better, the working conditions are better, and they're not exposed to pesticides. I guess those are positive things. But meanwhile, our warehouses that could be converted to uh, vibrant organic products being produced are being used to produce marijuana. And I don't really feel like marijuana is always the best use of our agricultural resources. I think there are environmental concerns. I think there are cultural concerns. <clears throat> I, uh, I know a lot of pot farmers. I was married to a pot farmers, um, you know, or <laughs> to a pot farmer at, at one time. I just don't think that uh, I, this is the best use of our agricultural uh, ca capacity for this area and uh, for the benefit our, of our community. And I think that there are but the amount of revenue that was gained from that, that was shockingly low to me, considering the value of the marijuana industry. So um, just remember Watsonville, remember the nature of our agricultural history when you're um, protecting those uh, more affluent suburban neighborhoods. Thank you. There are another speakers, Chair. Okay. Just one more check if there's anybody from the public who has not spoken wants to speak on this. We'll return it to the board. I'll direct uh, action comments from uh, Supervisor Friend who brought this. Thanks. Yeah, thank you again, Mr. Chair. And, and I just want to address a couple of the, the questions other my colleagues, including yourself, have sort of raised. I mean, ultimately, the modifications that I'm proposing maintain the existing framework that we spent a couple of years on. I mean, uh, candidly, at the end of the day, overwhelmingly this 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 activity is still going to occur within the second district i mean the first district has the manufacturing side but but we're really uh, my district has the cultivation side and, and what's being proposed is not going to substantially shift this to any other location it's just going to eliminate those conflict points um between the residentially zoned areas or leaders in particular which is where this has been disproportionately difficult and then some areas in the greater La Selva area. But that's that's really what this is looking at. And I tried very hard actually in my work uh, with both the neighborhoods, uh, with the Farm Bureau, with the cannabis licensing officer to, to try and come up with something that that honored uh, what both Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Koenig were noting, which is that this is realistically an industry that's gonna be in existence here. Um, and this is not an attempt in any way, shape or form to, uh, to undo any of the work that the board had previously done. It's just that we look at, at ordinances over time, and this is such an evolving space, even more so than, than any other land use decision that we've made over the last uh, decade or so, that I think it's reasonable to, to make these modifications. The, the debate about whether or not the Pajaro Valley should have switched from apples to lettuce and then lettuce to berries and, and maybe berries to cannabis is one that's a valid uh, larger question, and the board has had those discussions, uh, I mean, sort of alluding to what the last caller was saying, but ultimately what I think that we've been consistent on, even though we've had some really robust debates, and, and, and as you know, I've been on the losing side of some of those discussions, is that we never intended it to occur in residentially zoned areas, ever. I mean, be it dispensing, uh, manufacturing, or cultivation, and yet uh, what we didn't address was when these are immediately adjacent to, it has the same de facto issue of, of existing in a residentially zoned area. So what my proposal is, is to move the recommended actions on this, this item, but to provide a diff additional direction where the staff is to return in November, which is already within the recommended actions, but specifically with updates on the non-retail ordinance that include a prohibition of cultivation on CA uh, zone parcels that are adjacent to residentially zoned parcels plus a setback of 500 feet. And as I noted, that maintains still over 800 parcels of, of, that are open to still do this cultivation create a noticing community input and appealability process that we can simply just mirror after what we just adopted uh, for the retail side. Uh, to come back with information on current permit holders that might be in conflict with these new zoning and setback concerns, how many there are, uh, and just provide information on whether there are ways that could mitigate or address that issue. And lastly, to create a moratorium on approval of any new permits uh, or any permits that would that would come in conflict with this uh, CA property adjacent to residentially zone plus 500 feet while this ordinance uh, is being considered. So that would come back on September 14th, the proposal for the moratorium. Uh, the actual ordinance revisions would come back in November. And as a reminder, it still has to go through quite a, a large public process. It has to come to us, it has to go to the Postal Commission, et cetera. 
Uh, so it's going to be a long time until these changes are actually put into place, which is why I think that there should be a moratorium that the board should consider in September in advance of that long process. So that's my motion. I'll, uh, I'll second. Okay. And so that's to uh, come back um, September 14th in relation to the moratorium and a revision uh, to discuss the ordinance revisions on in November. That, that clear? Okay. Um, please call the roll. Uh, or do you, excuse me, do you want any comments? I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I'd just like to uh, appreciate the motion and move an amendment uh, that on November 9th, staff include an evaluation of the potential impacts of the changes proposed by Supervisor Friend. Uh, and additionally, the staff return with options that would potentially uh, support the cannabis industry or increase tax revenue. I mean, that, that, that's a reasonable amendment because generally speaking, when this stuff comes back, uh, they provide the context as to what the impacts of the ordinance would be. So I, I see that as a friendly amendment, I have no issue with. Um, and I would, I would hope that Mr. LaForte would always come back with the, what this would do or not do in regards to um, what our proposed interests are. Still, with that said, um, I, I think that, so I will accept that as a friendly amendment. I do believe though that ultimately, um, I, I can't support something that continues to allow this cultivation against residentially zoned districts. I, I hope that the board would agree with that when it comes back in November. Chair, yes. um, on November 9th, are we, is staff supposed to return with code modifications or just a report on the potential code modifications and the effects of them per supervisor friend motion supervisor friends motion and supervisor koenig's um addition is it just is it both or 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 one so i'm asking for uh, the code modifications to come back i figured in the staff report there would be a consideration based on supervisor koenig's comment or or amendment that would provide whether or not what these issues are or aren't in consideration, because ultimately that's what's gonna inform whether the board's comfortable with making this decision either way. I don't consider them to be two separate analyses that need to happen. Proposals rather than specific code amendments uh, for other ways to support the industry. Okay, okay. yeah. Okay. We have Please call the roll. Yeah. Okay. So this is for item 8.1. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Good discussion. Thank you, Mr. LaForty, for all your work on this. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we go to, I don't know, I think we'll go through, might as well go through. I'd like to get uh, right through before we go into uh, closed session about noontime. Uh, number, item number nine is to consider and approve in concept an ordinance adding chapter 7.61 to the Santa Cruz County Code to establish the Santa Cruz Monterey Merced San Benito Mariposa, better known as the SCMMSBM, <laughs> Managed Medical Care Commission and repealing chapter 7.58 to terminate the Santa Cruz Monterey Merced Managed Medical Care Commission and schedule a second reading of the final adoption of the ordinance on September 14th, 2021, as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Health Services. We have an ordinance adopting the Santa Cruz County 7.61, Santa Cruz Monterey, Merced Santa Cruz, or San Benito Mariposa Managed Care, Managed Medical Care Commission. Um, I don't know that we're going to have a presentation on this. Oh, um, just a point of order, Chair. Uh, we do have a scheduled item at 1045, item 12. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. That is very, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Okay, I'm sorry. We're going to skip to item number 12 as the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, Zone 6. It's a public hearing to consider formation of the assessment district to fund the, the maintenance of the Rio Del Mar Flats Drainage improvements, close the public hearing and continue the public hearing to September 14th, 2021 to allow for tabulation and certification of the assessment ballot results and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of zone six district engineer. Yes, sir. Good morning, Chair Good morning. McPherson and directors. Sorry. I'm Kent Edler, assistant director of public works as well as the assistant district engineer for zone six. This item before you today is regarding the Rio Del Mar Flats 
benefit assessment district, which is being considered for formation in order to fund the operations and maintenance of a pump station and associated drainage facilities, which zone six will be constructing if the formation passes. The pump station and drainage improvement project would alleviate the common flooding issues in the Rio Del Mar Flats area up to the approximate 10 year event. Zone six staff was awarded a grant from FEMA for of $600,000 for the design of the project and an additional 4.2 million in grants has been awarded for the construction. Although $4.8 million in grants have been received for the design and construction of the project, there aren't grants available or another identified funding source for the ongoing annual operations and maintenance. So the property owners in the area who have a direct benefit from reduced flooding are being asked to form the assessment district in order to cover the approximately $121,000 in annual operations and maintenance costs. The amount would increase annually by the lesser of two and a half percent for the consumer price index. The project to relieve flooding in the Rio Del Mar Flats has been the culmination of many years of study by Zone 6 staff, our engineering consultants, the Coastal Commission, FEMA, as well as state parks. It also was subject to a thorough environmental review process, which included public noticing and a public hearing. Numerous community meetings have also been held and articles in the Aptos Times regarding the project and the proposed assessment have been written by Director Friend as well as myself. The Rio Del Mar Flats area was developed in the 1920s and the drainage system installed at that time was inadequate. Basically, the area is too flat to effectively drain the area into Aptos Creek, so the proposed project would disconnect a portion of the drainage that currently drains to the creek in order to alleviate the flooding. If the assessment district formation does not pass, there would not be enough funds to operate and maintain the pumps and the drainage facilities. Not being able to properly operate and maintain a system like this could create other issues. So the, prop so, uh, the project won't be constructed if the assessment district is not established. Zone six staff would also have to decline the $4.2 million in construction grants from FEMA, Cal OES, and the Department of Water Resources. Ballots were mailed out to property owners following the June 29th, 2021 board meeting. Property owners have up to the close of the public hearing today to turn in ballots at either the Department of Public Works or outside or in the board chambers here. And there's a box right behind me. So the recommended actions are open the public hearing and hear objections, if any, to the proposed Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 6 Real Del Mar Flats Drainage Improvement Maintenance Assessment District close the public testimony portion of the public hearing, direct the election department to tabulate the submitted ballots and continue the public hearing to September 14th, 2021 to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballot results. Also wanna point out that a Zoom link has been set up for the public to view the ballot opening or the ballot tabulation by the elections department. The link is located on the Public Works website on the bottom left of the page in a light blue box. Interested parties can click on that link for details on how to join the meeting. The link was also is also available on the civicmike.com website in the news section. Note that per the recommended actions will return on September 14th with certification of the ballot results and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Before we go back to the board, I'd like to open the public hearing to the public. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Doug Spinelli. I'm a property owner. Uh, in the in the flats area, I recently wrote a three-page letter and gave a copy to each member of the board and to the uh, director of public works. To date, I haven't received any reply from anybody, so I came here in person just to express some of the concerns that I have with this project. My first question is, how did the county determine that the existing drainage system is inadequate when based upon my uh, personal surveillance of, or inspection of these uh, drain basins, about 50% of them are plugged completely. The remaining of the remaining 50%, about 25% are about half plugged and live vegetation is seen growing inside some of these catch basins. I also have observed that there are pigeons nesting in one of the drop of uh, the pipes that conveys the water from the area to the Aptos Creek. So it makes me wonder 
what Public Works is doing to you know help relieve this problem. And I, I kind I was just up to the Public Works Department, and I asked about the amount of maintenance. Go ahead. The amount of maintenance that is occurring at the site, and I just got some sketchy answers. So I would like to have that information clarified because I don't think they're doing the proper maintenance to make the system work properly. And a second, I had a second point here. <clears throat> oh, I want to question, you know, the assessment district itself, how people are being selected to be. Let's go. Can I, can, okay. I just want to get some more information so I can see uh, how they're determining who's benefiting from this proposed, proposed uh, solution to the problem. And I'd like more information on that. I know from my personal experience, my house, over 35 years, my house has had water pond on, but only three times. And I solved that problem with a $100 submersible pump. So it makes me wonder why we have to spend all this money on, on these things when maybe a more simple solution is available. Okay, thank, thank you. you sir. Oh, you know, I did ask for a written reply and I hope I can get one. I don't know if you could, if you want to briefly answer any of those at this point, Mr. Adler. Or do we... Sure, I can. I yeah. can certainly address some of the some of the questions. I was taking notes. Um, so, how did the first? How did the county determine that the drainage system wasn't adequate? Um, we've had our engineering staff review um, hydraulic modeling and looking at the the system. Basically, the drainage system out there is incredibly flat, and it drains to Aptos Creek. So, what happens is that during heavy rainfall events. I'll just use the layman's terms that there's not enough power in the system to get the water out into the creek. So the water during the rainfall events is basically backed up by the by the high flows in the creek. So that's the, the basic um, reasons why the system is inadequate. Um, so regarding the the system being um, plugged up and, and so forth now, um, we have had our our maintenance staff out there recently to take a look. Part of the problem is that, again, the, the water levels are really high in the creek right now. So when they go through there and they look at it, it's full of water because it can't drain out. So they're waiting till, you know, in, in the late September before the rainy season comes so they can get in there and really inspect the system and get everything cleaned out before the, before the rainy season. Um, and so, you know, we go through there and we do that um, annually. And then so how was the assessment district formation, you know, the parcels determined? So we looked at the, the hydraulic modeling um, and determined what the flood elevations would be um, based on, you know, how, how properties would benefit by this project. So it, it, it affects properties up to the 10 year event. So the assessment district was broken down into several different elevations. So there's properties that are at, who touch the 14 foot elevation, the 16 foot elevation and the 18 foot elevation. So the lower you are, the more you would flood. So those properties would have a higher assessment. So any property that's getting assessed, um, well, properties that are getting assessed would be touching those 14, 16 and 18 foot elevations. Additionally, properties that are maybe not in the, in the real Delmar Flats area, but they would have to drive through the flooded areas or the areas that would benefit by this by this project. So there we looked at those properties as well because they would receive a direct benefit by no longer having to drive through flooded areas. And so our modeling and mapping shows shows the areas of the properties that would receive the direct benefit. Thank you. Okay. Is, is that open for discussion? Well, just one question if you have. If, oh, no, okay. Or a couple, very briefly. No, 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 that's okay, I can wait. I, I, I question some of the things that he said. There are alternate routes to get out of the area. You, you don't have to drive, for most people, they don't have to drive through the flooded areas. Okay, thank you, sir, for yeah. okay. your interest. Are there any other comments from the public? I have two on Zoom. Two are on Three Zoom. now. <laughs> okay. Caller 2915, your microphone is available.
Becky, your microphone is available. We'll go down to Tuka G. Oh, sorry. She's unmuted. Okay. Hello? Hello, we can hear you, Becky. Becky Steinbrunner, I, I didn't hear that you, you wanted me to speak. Is it my time? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, this is Becky Steinbrunner. I, I have attended some, ver some of the meetings um, and, and really have a question as to whether if, if the current system is not working because of high water levels in Aptos Creek, Will the new system work with the effluent being pumped out to the beach during high tide times? What, what guarantees us that in sea level rise or high tide storm event that this new system would work? I'm concerned that it will not. And I have seen some of the correspondence on the website by the homeowners in the area where the effluent would be pumped out as to potential damage to their areas that has already been somewhat imperiled by storm events. So I would like to hear from Mr. Edler about that uh, possibility. A 10-year event is really nothing now, given, given climate change and sea level rise and very um, extreme storm events. I would like to see the effluent pumped off-site to perhaps the state park area where there could be ponds, winter ponds, for uh, groundwater recharge percolation rather than pumping it onto the beach and uh, possibly having it not work. Now, I realize that is an extreme increase in uh, electricity to pump it, but ultimately it could solve the problem. With the pipes being flat, uh, the, the sand that accumulates in the street is going to uh, clog the drains. As this former speaker said, they're, they're already clogged. I understand the new pumping system would have larger pipes, but just because the pipes are larger, that does not necessarily guarantee that. Gafari, your microphone is available. As a reminder, it is star six to unmute your phone call. Tuka Gafari, second call. I see they've unmuted their microphone. Tika, your microphone is unmuted. I see that you've accepted the unmute. We'll move on to call Dale Flowers. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions. First of all, the uh, this political process or the public uh, process that we've been going through has been uh, flawed from the start. <laughs> what had seemed to happen is you had a solution and then it's been trying to persuade us, the neighbors here, to buy into this solution. And there's a lot of questions about it. And so one question I have is this proportional voting. Voting on the assessment district, some, some people get more than one vote, commercial interests. And that I think that needs to be explained uh, clear, you know, like uh, somebody down owns the uh, a commercial uh, property down there gets 20 votes and someone else like self gets one vote. So this proportional voting idea about the assessment district, I think, is questionable. The idea of the public interest, this is a des Rio Del Mar is a destination point. And it's also a traffic uh, alternative when when Highway 1 is clogged up, all the the cars are coming through here. So defining this so narrowly, uh, the public benefit is, is I don't think, quite fair. Uh, I, what I was looking for originally was, hey, here's, here are all the po potential options that we can have and an evaluation of those. I know during the pandemic, it's been hard to have a public meeting, 
but I think we need that. The getting information about, and frankly, just doing what we're doing today has been very difficult. Getting information about what's going on has been impossible. Mostly it's been coming from neighbors finding, well, there's going to be a meeting and you can give some input. So uh, I guess one last question, did the Coastal Commission uh, approve this project? That's my comments. It's, it just uh, it seems a very frustrating process. I think we should just stop and start all over and educate uh, everybody about it. I think um, the, those a couple of those questions could be answered briefly. Is it because of Prop Two Eighteen and so forth? Yes, that's that's correct. That's how the, the assessment the voting. Assessment. You might just briefly explain that. Yeah. So so per Proposition Two Eighteen, um, it's a it's a weighted ballot. So um, people that have a higher assessment, they'd be counted. Their votes would count more. So for instance, if somebody has a three hundred dollar assessment and somebody else has a hundred dollar assessment, the three hundred dollar assessment is going to count three times as much. So that's per Prop Two Eighteen. Um, so. You know, and I, I'm, a, I'm a little puzzled by um, it, it, the comment about it's been impossible to get information about, about the project. There was, this w went through a public hearing, um, environmental review with public noticing. We've mailed flyers out to every property owner in the area, letting them know about public meetings. We've set up dedicated websites on there. I've done multiple um, public meetings. There's been articles in the Aptos Times. So there's, we we've had a, a, just a ton of information out there um, and, and, and I've been available. I've given my email address. So um, a lot of people have been contacting me with questions about it. Um, has the Coastal Commission approved the project? This project was not required to have approval by the Coastal Commission. It has a coastal permit that was issued by, that went through the zoning administrator. It's outside the Coastal, coastal Commission's jurisdiction. However, I wanna point out that the Coastal Commission uh, did review the project and there was an extensive back and forth with the Coastal Commission. So um, so they are, they essentially uh, approved what we were proposing and they didn't oppose the project. But the project does have a coastal permit. Thank you for those comments. Gaurav Singh, your microphone is available. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, taking my, my comments. Um, so, you know, we are on Beach Drive and I share uh, some of the concerns that the other neighbors have uh, in terms of the new location for the outfall. Uh, so effectively, we are dumping thousands of gallons of water into this area, which uh, has existing homes, uh, the Beach Drive uh, and the sand, right? So there is no way of knowing what will happen to that area when you redirect thousands of gallons of water. Uh, thanks to Kent and his team, they did make available some of the engineering reports. Uh, so we looked at the engineering reports and there is no way to establish that this would be safe for the homes that already exist there. So I would highly reconsider the location. Um, I think this would actually cause unintended consequences that have, I mean, we have no way of knowing what would happen. Uh, it looks like there were alternative proposals there which would reuse the existing drains. Um, and I think that that seems like a simpler solution it would avoid having to assess the existing uh, homes with this uh, new new tax, if you may. Uh, so I would highly uh, encourage the 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 um, uh, the board to reconsider the, the the locations. It's it's a very unnatural way of redirecting thousands of gallons of water to a an area that honestly has never seen that level of water. So what it does to that neighborhood, that area, uh, is 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 actually uh, very very concerning. Uh, so that's my 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 comment, um, and I think thanks again for uh, making that uh, engine report available to us. But I, like I mentioned, I think there is really no way of knowing what happens to that water, where it goes, and and what 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 uh, other damage could it cause to that area. Thank you. Hi, I'll try it again. Sorry about that. Uh, I've been living there for 14 years in the real Domer Flats, and I've seen the floods happen, come and go, and they're not as frequent as um, as one would think. The pipes were built in the 1920s, and I don't think they can handle today's uh, amount of water traffic. So when I talked to one of the engineers in the, about 2010, he showed me maps that they drained the water from the higher elevated areas into the flats, and they were going to work on a system to get the water out of the flats. This is a problem that was created by the county itself. And the solutions 
are many in some examples like Rye, New York, where they use barrels and collect the water from the roofs. And if every house had between two to four barrels, that could be about 40,000 gallons of water or more, and then let it drain into the soil naturally. And if we do that, we're gonna prevent saltwater intrusion. It's already an issue coming up with saltwater intrusion. If we pump the water out, we're gonna have another environmental issue in the flat area. And also we don't have to use electricity or power for pumping the system, uh, the water out into the ocean. So my vote is no on this, and I think the county should look at other solutions other than um, systems with pumps and electricity. We can use gravity and also drain the water naturally into the ground itself is what we need. Thank you so kindly. Turn this to the board. Um, uh, maybe Supervisor Friend, this is in your district. Did you wanna make a comment? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Edler, for the presentation. You know, um, obviously, this is an ongoing issue that predates uh, even the nine years that I've been in office. It was one of the things that was made uh, very clear to me that residents within the Rio de Mar Flats wanted addressed. And every year that this occurs, usually multiple times a year, we receive uh, a lot of inquiries as to how the system can get fixed. Over the course of that time, I've had a a lot of community meetings in Rio de Mar, generally in association with the Rio de Mar Improvement Association held at the Rio Sands Hotel. They're right in the middle of where this, this flooding occurs. Uh, we've written articles, we've done mailings, we've held virtual town halls in the last year. I mean, there, there's been a, a lot of outreach and, and actually, uh, you know, I think that, that just given the number of people that have, that have expressed concerns about the issue, uh, it, it shows the evidence that as to why public works went out um, and, and I think actually in some respects pulled America out in order to get this kind of funding for multiple public agencies uh, when they're dealing with uh, resource situations of protected species within the creek uh, needing, um, although they didn't need approval, uh, clearly having Coastal Commission provide input. And I was a part of some of those discussions where Coastal uh, asked for and supported the perk on the beach. Um, having commentary about the, the groundwater recharge component, talking about how this would or would not impact federally protected species within the creek. I mean, this is a very complex project, and it's also a project that, that costs millions of dollars, and, and those millions of dollars have now been obtained through uh, multiple grant processes that took a significant amount of time to get. Um, and so, obviously, I think that this is a, a, a good solution for that area. Uh, as Mr. Edler said, I mean, obviously, what is good, the one good thing, though, about Prop 218 is the public gets a decision about whether they uh, support an assessment like this in order to have this solution. Um, uh, uh, voting against it, unfortunately, would mean that, there, that the money would need to be returned because we couldn't meet the terms of the grant for construction and maintenance. Uh, there really isn't a plan B on funding associated with this, so... Uh, because there really can't be. This was a project that that was constructed with the concurrence and support of all these other resource agencies that have a say in how this would actually be done. So I think that, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that we'll determine that the votes are in support of it so we can start eliminating this historic flooding issue. I mean, these are homes that were constructed on a historic floodplain, so it shouldn't really surprise uh, the community that, that, that these areas are going to flood. This is a solution that helps address some of those natural occurring issues that would occur down there, whether there was a drainage system or not installed. And this addresses the most common occurrence, which is uh, up to a 10 year occurrence situation. But I, I do want to reiterate the fact, and, and just for my colleagues, and I know that you've heard this from me before, but there was a lot of outreach to the community and there continues to be on this. And so, uh, I mean, I, otherwise, I think my wife would wonder what I was doing on all those nights down in Rio de Mar, because we've had a lot of community meetings down there, uh, just having this one subject that, that Public Works has been down there, resource agencies have been down there, and we've really tried to provide all the answers that we could, as well as discuss what the engineering solution would be associated with that. So um, I, I just want to express appreciation, irrespective of, of which way ultimately the vote goes, to uh, Rachel Fatui's work, Ken Edler's work, and others that have worked on this for, for years in order to try and bring a solution to the community that that uh, as far as construction costs go, didn't cost anything. I mean, over $5 million in grants, uh, including environmental review and on and on and on in order to come up with this situation. So um, I, I appreciated the comments though from, from the public hearing today, they're comments that we've heard over the course of this public outreach and we'll see over the course of time uh, what the community down there seeks about the flood protection or not. Comments from the board? 
Uh, just a brief question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Adler, what a level of sea level rise would the new proposed infrastructure be able to accommodate? I mean, I understand a, a 10 year event, but of course I, I think it was uh, in Tennessee recently that we saw a thousand year event. Um, so could you just help us understand how resilient this infrastructure is gonna be? So the, the infrastructure where the, I think the majority of the, or the, some of the comments have been made about the, about the outlet. The outlet is located on the beach. It's above the high tide line, um, but the, the water would drain down into the soil and be soaked in, you know, basically infiltrate into the soil. I don't have, um, the project isn't intended to address sea level rising, is sea level rise. It's intended to address kind of the current flooding situations and the 10 year event, it's, it's, we say it's approximate because there's a lot of different factors that can affect how well the system works and at what levels it'll, it'll address. So I can't really say with specifics um, how sea level rise um, would affect it, but the project isn't being designed to address sea level rise. Have you considered uh, other solutions that would be more resilient in say a hundred or thousand year event? Well, there's really not much that, that other options out there because the whole area is flat. I mean, it's in the, the area is in a hundred year flood zone. It's in a hundred year wave run up area as well. So um, this is intended to address the lower level storms at the bigger, bigger level storms, the hundred up to a hundred year event. The system isn't going to, it, it's not going to alleviate the flooding in the, in those issues. So that's, that's not really the intention of it. So those huge events, the whole, the whole area is just going to be overwhelmed. Got it. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions from board members? Uh, hearing none, uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Moved and seconded. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you, Chair. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, and although item number 24 is 12.1, we're going to go back to number nine and go through. And as you know, as me as the chair, I'd like to just keep on going. Um, now, item number nine, I'm not going to repeat the ordinance uh, in the chapter uh, to establish the Santa Cruz, Monterey, Merced, San Benito, Mariposa Managed Medical Care Commission. And we do have uh, Health Services uh, Director Mimi Hall available where she'll give a, a short staff report on this item. Oh, it virtually? She'll be virtually. Okay, yes. very good. Yes. Good morning, Honorable Board of Supervisors. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, thank you. And I would just like to note that I'm joined today by Stephanie Sunshine, Chief Executive Officer of the Central Health. California Alliance for Health, who is available to provide additional information. Director Hall, Director Hall, I apologize to interrupt. This is Supervisor yeah. Friend. I don't know if your your audio is actually plugged in, but we're, we're getting to you in a very low volume um, remotely. So if you would just try one more time, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. I apologize. Um, okay, okay, let's try it again. Now she, we can't hear you uh, with that. Uh, you're not plugged in. Okay. Is this any better? I apologize. Yes. Okay. I apologize. I um, had to reset my settings and these are the challenges that come with virtual meetings. Um, so I just, uh, good morning, I'm Mimi Hall, Health Services Agency Director for the County of Santa Cruz. And I'd just like to note that I'm joined today by Stephanie Sunshine, Chief Executive Officer of the Central California Alliance for Health. She is available to answer questions for additional information as needed. As your board is aware, Medi-Cal is California's Medicaid program and it is the state's health insurance program for over 13 million Californians with low incomes. It covers 40% of all California's children, half of people with disabilities. It also pays for 50% of all births in the state and 58% of all patient days in long-term care facilities. 
every Manical beneficiary in California is covered by, um, it, it gets their health care through six main models of managed care. And in Santa Cruz County, the Central California Alliance for Health, also known as the Alliance, is a model that is a county organized health system. This means that it is a single managed care organization that serves uh, one county or a group of geographically contiguous counties. Currently, the Alliance serves beneficiaries in Santa Cruz, Monterey, and Merced counties. And the current Santa Cruz, Monterey, Merced Medical Managed Care Commission serves as the organization's governing board. Over the past year in uh, 2020 and 2021, California Department of Healthcare Services provided technical assistance to counties regarding their option to change their Medi-Cal managed care type. And it allowed county organized health systems such as the Alliance to expand uh, to geographically contiguous counties. San Benito County and Mariposa counties had submitted their intent to join the Alliance managed care organization and receive support of the current Santa Cruz Monterey Merced Medical Managed Care Commission. So in order to proceed with this model change, counties must submit to the Department of Healthcare Services an executed county ordinance to formalize the choice and change their Medi-Cal managed care model by October 1st of 2021. So approval of today's recommended items are a first step in the passage of an ordinance to be heard on September 14th. And should that ordinance pass on September 14th, that will allow for expansion of the Alliance service area. And it will also expand the governing entity, the commission to include San Benito and Mariposa counties. And the voting members of the new commission will expand to include representatives from all five counties of the new managed medical care commission. So, uh, with that background, I recommend today that the board consider and approve in concept the attached ordinance, adding chapter 7.61 to the Santa Cruz County Code and eliminating, terminating chapter 7.58. And additionally, I ask that the board take action to schedule a second reading and final adoption of the ordinance on September 4th, 2021. of its type uh, outside of the Central Coast Community Energy, and it looks like a real good move in that direction. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, you are the appointee from this board for the Managed Medical Care Commission. Uh, do you have any initial comments? Yeah, uh, I think just two comments. One is, um, as, as Director Hall noted, the, the healthcare landscape uh, is challenging and changing um and uh and i think that the alliance has really stepped up to provide care to our members half of which are kids um and uh and in this difficult time it's more important than ever than we have we've had a safety net um and both the the sort of day-to-day -day quality of care as well as uh the grants that create a uh more robust um, system for, for our members has been really important. And um, this expansion has, is, and, and then this expansion will allow us to obviously cover more people um, and hopefully leverage resources in a way that, that benefits all of our members across all of our communities. And the second part is, um, you know, this is also, this is fundamentally about governance. Uh, and I think the Alliance uh, staff and leadership and Stephanie Sonnenshine, um, as well as the board is try to figure out a way to make sure that we uh, incorporate uh, these potentially new counties with, without sort of diminishing the leadership from existing, um, <clears throat> existing counties uh, in the system. And I think this is a good balance to preserve a manageable board, but also um, good representation across uh, these very, very different counties. Uh, thousands more uh, for better m medical care in our in our area. Um, any other comments from the board before we go to the public? Seeing none, hearing none. Any comments from the public? None here in the chamber. Any on the phone? There are no or speakers via Zoom. Okay, I'll return it to the board for action. Supervisor Coonerty. Move the recommended actions. Second. Second. 
second for whoever. Please call the roll. That was a motion by Coonerty, second by Koenig. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, we will go to item number 10 to consider adopting an ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1332, uh, 13.32, regarding mobile home park rent adjustment as recommended by the Mobile Home and Manufactured Home Commission and schedule the ordinance for second reading and final adoption as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Koenig and Friend. Uh, we have recommendations uh, letter a text of the proposed amendments and ordinance amend amending sections 1332.070 and 13.32080. Um, uh, Supervisor Koenig, did you wanna open this discussion? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this uh, issue was brought to the attention of myself and Supervisor Friend um, that currently uh, our mobile home rent, uh, rent control ordinance does not cover non-sale transfers. And so um, that's cases like inheritance or foreclosure. Um, so you can imagine how, how frustrating this could be. Um, you know, there was a story of a young man who inherited a mobile home from his mother. Um, you know, obviously his mother was hoping to provide her son an affordable place to live in our county, uh, one of very few left. Um, and uh, unfortunately, upon um, that transfer, because it was not a sale, it was an inheritance, um, he saw the, the rent at the park increase substantially. It was no longer an affordable unit. Uh, and if, so he, he could not afford to stay in there. Uh, and then also, of course, it reduced the value of the property inherited um, because it would be less valuable um, to, to sell to someone else. It becomes less desirable without the carryover of those rent control provisions. The other case I mentioned, of course, is uh, in the case of foreclosures, um, because uh, you know very few financial institutions uh, are are willing to make mobile home loans uh, today. Um, thankfully, our local uh, Bay Federal uh, Credit Union does continue to make those loans, but um, because our rent control ordinance does not uh, mobile home rent control ordinance does not cover uh, foreclosures, they basically have um, a very much increased liability um, in the case that someone is not able to make their payments. Um, and so without this change, uh, they could either, uh, they could very well cease to make these kinds of loans, which would of course uh, make mobile homes um, a less available option for, for people uh, needing affordable housing in our community. So um, the, the primary change to the ordinance uh, is to address that so that, um, that the rent, uh, rent control measures are carried over in the case of non-sale transfers like inheritance and foreclosure. It also provides uh, individual unit uh, holders the opportunity um, to uh, a, a legal channel to sue in the case that they feel they have had their uh, individual rent unfairly increased. Um, that opportunity does not exist for individual unit holders today. Now, yeah, I, it's my understanding there are about 2,000 uh, mobile home spaces that are fall under this, our regulations would stand to grow uh, with the, if this passes. Um, Supervisor Friend, do you have any other comments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Koenig, for that thorough introduction to the item. Um, as many of you know, the mobile homes really are, uh, manufactured homes really are an essential affordable housing element in our county, um, both uh, predating Supervisor Koenig, but within his district and definitely within my district and shared there with Supervisor Caput, we've seen challenges to our mobile home ordinance for from uh, park owners that have tried to take away affordable housing options for the community and our local ordinance has withstood the test of time it has become a statewide model and it really is an essential ordinance i reached out to the author of the ordinance uh regarding these cha proposed changes and he had said to me uh that that he didn't realize that was always the intent that these things be included in there didn't realize that it was being interpreted where they weren't explicitly in it uh it's our belief that these are really de minimis but essential changes to this ordinance right here, our mobile home commission thoroughly reviewed this and is completely supportive of, and also great appreciation to Henry Cleveland and others on the mobile home commission who have been ensuring that our ordinance gets updated when necessary to provide this essential component. So um, definitely appreciate the board support on this. I think that it's uh, it was always the intent of the original ordinance to include this in, and now we're just cleaning it up to ensure that it's explicitly stated. Thank you. I'd just like to mention and thank the Mobile and Manufacturing Home Commission. Uh, it's one of our 
well, I think 40 commissions and committees that we have in this county, they're very valuable to us and thank you for bringing this to our attention. Uh, any comments from the public here in the chamber? Any other comments? Online? There are no speakers on Zoom. Okay, we'll return it to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, we will go to item number 11 to conduct, conduct a study session on the 2020 Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy or CEDES or SEDS five-year plan with the summary of COVID-19 impacts on economic development as outlined in the memorandum uh, by the Director of Human Services. We have uh, the CEDES uh, 2020 study session presentation. Um, I do believe um, Andy Stone is going to be uh, it's correct. Yes, sir. Hi, Mr. Stone. Excuse me. The County of Santa Cruz Workforce uh, Development Board Director. Thank you. Good morning, Chair McPherson and members of the board. Andy Stone, Workforce Development Board Director. Today, I am joined by Josh Williams from BW Research, as well as Peter Detlefs, who is uh, the Business Services Manager for the Workforce Development Board, who is standing by. So, Josh Williams is joining us virtually, and. So today, today we're going to talk about the comprehensive economic development strategy, which was approved by your board in May of 2020. At that time, you requested we come back with a study session to dive a little deeper into the details of the report, as well as give an update on um, some of the economic impacts of COVID. So, Hello, um, good morning. Thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, as, um, as Annie just said, I'd like to go through um, the, the comprehensive economic development strategy that we developed uh, with the Santa Cruz County Workforce Development Board, uh, and then some research that we did looking at uh, some of the economic impacts uh, of the pandemic uh, on the county, both from a kind of an economic perspective, but also looking at, at what it did in terms of uh, uh, the world of work. Um, with that, uh, Andy, can you uh, switch to the next slide? So yeah, we'll, we'll you know here's here's the cover for the this is for the uh, the SEDS and SEDS is the acronym for a comprehensive economic development strategy. Um, so as I said, we're going to look at kind of what the SEDS uh, was, both in terms of the the process to kind of to, to create it and some of the components uh, that came out of that uh, that project. Uh, look at some of the key findings from the from the SEDS and the, the kind of the follow-up pandemic economic analysis, um, and then really look at kind of the state of the workforce, which is a uh, report that we recently completed to kind of look at where the workforce you know is and kind of where it's heading as we uh, as we hope to uh, uh, get out of some of the uh, you know the significant impacts uh, from the pandemic. So those are kind of the the, the items I'd like to discuss this, uh, this morning. Um, the, the first slide really just kind of looks at, we looked at the, uh, the county, um, you know, most of the data that we were pulling is for the county as a whole, but we did break it up uh, into different areas, you know, both, you know, Capitola, the city, Scotts Valley, and incorporated area of Watsonville. Uh, we also uh, looked at, you know, kind of splitting the county in half, kind of looking at the south and the north. So these are some of the different ways we looked at uh, uh, the county's economy and its workforce, um, both in terms of, you know, overall, but also in some of these smaller geographic areas within the county. Let's, uh, uh, let's jump to the next slide. So this first, uh, this first group of kind of slides is really taking a look at comprehensive uh, economic development strategy, uh, the key components in the process. Next slide. Um, the, 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 the SEDS process really started before, you know, kind of well before the, um, the pandemic uh, hit uh, and we were kind of planning and talking about it in kind of uh, or started the process in early 2019. Um, and the purpose really of the SEDS is to do, do a few things. It's really meant for, to provide relevant st st stakeholders uh, with a deeper understanding of kind of the social and economic trends, uh, factors and metrics within, within uh, the Santa Cruz County. Um, it also then is supposed to serve as a guide for kind of how do we look at uh, and develop kind of data-driven policies and decision-making within, you know, within the outline uh, for economic development, so kind of a strategic planning uh, document. 
Uh, and it's you know required to be updated every five years uh, to allow you know the county to qualify for you know grants uh, and, and and funding from uh, the economic development administration. So it allows um, the county to get you know federal funding from the Department of Commerce. So uh, with that, we'll let's uh, let's jump a little further uh, for our uh, for the Santa Cruz County SEDS. Uh, we really we started with an economic assessment of the current conditions, both for people and the workforce. Uh, we looked at it from an industry and kind of an employer perspective. We also looked at some of the things really connected to the uh, to the place, and those are things they're dealing with with housing and with infrastructure. Uh, and then the last one we we kind of developed, and to be honest, we were talking about resilience before the pandemic hit, but it became you know really relevant while in the middle, middle of the study. Um, you know, in February and March of 2020, um, you know, the, the pandemic became uh, something that, you know, was, was having a significant impact on the economy. Um, it also included a SWOT analysis. What are the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats uh, to, to Santa Cruz County's economy? Uh, next slide. Uh, it also includes a strategic action plan. Uh, it provides goals and objectives, goals and objectives of the SEDS, and kind of a, you know, here is kind of the, the, the structure and the framework of what an action plan would look like. It doesn't do all the details, but it provides really some, you know, some, some strategies and some categories and partners to move forward. Uh, and then lastly, it puts together an evaluation framework. You know, what would performance measures, you know, look like, how would they be used to assess, you know, an implementation of uh, economic development strategies in the county and how could that, you know, kind of uh, impact and drive kind of future uh, strategies as you learn from, um, um, you know, those initial um, tactics and strategies uh, for economic development. Um, with that, let's jump into the next slide. So uh, from the, you know, we had a, we had a good group uh, of, of stakeholders that were involved in, in the SEDS community, out, uh, community input. Uh, this include regional leader, leadership and stakeholders uh, from the different cities, uh, a lot of economic development managers, city managers uh, within, uh, within the county, um, but it also include public meetings. Um, and, you know, the meetings were largely, I mean, this was, this process is happening in April uh, uh, and May. We did, we were able to do one meeting kind of before um, the pandemic hit, and that was in person. These were largely done uh, online, and we also, um, provided opportunities for uh, public opinion and feedback, uh, again, in March and April. Uh, so that, that feedback was all done uh, online and through email and like that. Uh, next slide. Some of, the, some of the key findings from both the SEDS uh, and uh, um, a pandemic analysis that we did afterwards. And so this is kind of uh, includes, both, uh, includes both of those. Let's uh, jump to the next slide. Okay. Um, I mean, one of the things that's important for us to know um, is that, you know, one in six Santa Cruz County uh, uh, residents that works uh, leaves the county. Um, typically, you know, largely they're, they're moving, they're going down the valley to Silicon Valley for higher paying positions. Now, you know, you know, the plurality of those positions are in what we would call innovative and in STEM uh, occupations. You can see that that only represents about 42% of those Um you know, another 20% are found in kind of management sales and communication occupations. Um, other, you know, 10 to 12% are found in these other areas, population serving and tourism occupations, production and maintenance occupations, uh, and healthcare law, logistical. So one of the key findings here is that overall, uh, you know, 16% of your, you know, the people that live, you know, and this is a net number too. There's, it's actually probably a higher number because some people actually come into Santa Cruz County to work, but that's a much smaller portion. 16% um, of your of the people that live in Santa Cruz County and work uh, are traveling outside of the county for work, um, you know, net. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we can look at, and, and it's important to know the, the numbers that I'm, or the data that I'm showing you here is really before, it's through 2019, so it's before uh, the pandemic hit. Um, but you can see over the last five years, from 2014 to 2019, the largest growth uh, in terms of jobs were in population serving and tourism positions. That was about 8%. And then healthcare and municipal sector. Some of the export oriented and kind of innovative industries, they grew uh, at this period, uh, but they grew at a, at a slower rate at about 3 to 4% compared to the 8% growth uh, in employment. 
that we saw from healthcare and then the population serving industries. We, we break that down a little further. Let's let's jump into the to the next slides. Um, and you can see these are what those population serving industry clusters look like. Um, you know, it's tourism, uh, it's retail. Um, building and design actually saw the largest growth and the building design industry was largely driven uh, by, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, construction, a lot of the design work particularly. You see that fi uh, finance, insurance, and real estate uh, and professional business services grew at about 5%. Retail actually declined uh, in that time. Let's jump to the uh, the next slide. Uh, we can see that you know healthcare uh, municipal industry clusters. Um, these include kind of healthcare, education, knowledge creation, public services, water and energy. The, the size of the bubble represents the size of the total employment. So water and energy are are relatively small employers in terms of the number of jobs in the county, uh, whereas healthcare and education uh, represents a larger portion uh, of your total employment within the county. Well, let's jump to the next slide. Um, and then you can see the growth uh, in some of the export-oriented innovative uh, industry clusters, growth in wages. You can see that defense, aerospace, and tra transportation manufacturing saw you know, considerable growth in that 2014 to 2019 timeframe um, and brought in a lot of, you know, or, or I should say the majority of their were higher paying, uh, higher earning jobs, which is good uh, for the county. Um, wow you know, agriculture and food and other manufacturing saw small um, growth. You actually saw a slight decline in biotechnology and biomedical devices and some of the ICT industries. Now, it's important to recognize these are the industries and not necessarily the type of occupation. So what I mean by that is like information communication technologies could be a software firm, but there could be people that are software designers. And we actually have seen those occupations have grown. They've just grown in industries outside of software. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, later as well. Let's let's go to the next slide. Um, one of the good signs and one of the one of the positive um, things we, we we saw in looking at uh, kind of job changes between 2014, you know, through 2019, was that the tier one jobs and tier one are kind of your higher paying, higher wage positions that typically require uh, a four year degree or more grew uh, at about 12 percent. Uh, over that, you know, and grew more than your tier two and tier three. Tier two are kind of your middle skill, middle wage positions. Um, those typically have an average wage in Santa Cruz County of about $50,000 a year. Um, your tier three are your lower skill, lower wage positions. They have an average wage of about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year in Santa Cruz. The tier one positions are about $90,000, $90,000 to $100,000 a year. So the, the fastest growing occupations in, this, in these classifications were tier one positions. Uh, <clears throat> however, um, it is important to note, though, that a majority of Santa Cruz County uh, jobs are still currently tier three. Um, and um, while, the, while the trends are good, you still see that 52% of occupations tend to be classified in tier three. Uh, and that's largely because of the large percentage of kind of tourism uh, and agriculture positions that a majority of those are uh, tier three occupations. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we saw as a real challenge, um, you know, from an economic development, but even just from a, you know, a kind of equity and a quality of life uh, uh, issue uh, was the real difference in terms of Internet access at home um, by income. Uh, and you can see that, you know, over a third of households with, with you know, with less than $20,000 a year in income um, do not have access to the Internet. Um, and you can see that that number, you know, even. You know, households between twenty and seventy-five thousand dollars a year. You know, over um, you know one in uh, one in six uh, households did not have uh, access uh, to the internet at home, and so that's a challenge, uh, particularly in the pandemic. And you can see those with over seventy-five thousand dollars a year. That number drops down to three percent, a very you know really small percentage, and that's a problem for a multitude of reasons. But one, you know, in the pandemic and just in general. The importance of you know access uh, uh, at home, uh, internet access, is important not only for finding a job, but for you know access to, to education uh, and really even connection to a lot of the services and and things like that. Um, in the pandemic, became particularly important. So we think this is an area where we want to really look to improve and as a potential objective uh, moving forward. You know, from an economic development, but also uh, with uh, benefits that uh, will go beyond economic development for the county. Uh, next slide. One of the areas we spent uh, a lot uh, of time in the, the SEDS report and even in kind of the COVID 
um, state of the workforce research really looking at economic resilience. Uh, and one of the areas that we found uh, that is kind of a really important way of looking at kind of household economic resilience was really looking at uh, debt to income ratio. Uh, and one of the challenges that Santa Cruz County does is while it does have a relatively affluent population, you know, about a third of, of, the, of the population is living below what is considered kind of a living wage. Uh, and there is a relatively high debt to income ratio. Uh, meaning people, you know, obviously their debt to income is, is higher than, than the state average and also higher than the national average as well. Uh, and this, this is, you know, a concern as we, particularly as we look at kind of economic resilience. Um, let's jump to the next slide. Um, the, the SEDS also did, a, you know, a SWOT analysis. And for those maybe not familiar with that acronym, this is, you know, identifying the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And really from a, you know, from a perspective of, of, of economic development, but also in this, this idea of economic resilience. Um, you know, some of the strengths include kind of the location and quality of life uh, within Santa Cruz, both the, you know, the, the natural beauty and the proximity to Silicon Valley, you know, the culture, the outdoor oriented and kind of modern culture, the, you know, the strength of the, the tourism and hospitality industry, which brings really money in, brings money and revenue into the county from outside the area. Uh, and also the lo local education institutions and some of the renowned programs and faculty uh, and an educated workforce, you know, and again, that doesn't, that's not necessarily for the entire uh, population, but for uh, a majority uh, of the population. Some of the weaknesses are the cost of living and the trans transportation choke points, uh, the high proportion of kind of employment, you know, within the county that tends to be lower paying, particularly tourism and agriculture, um, income inequality and homelessness, uh, and really, you know, kind of exporting a lot of the high skilled local talent that's commuting. Uh, outside of uh, the county. Uh, those are some of the weaknesses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some of the opportunities. How do we capitalize on the outdoor lifestyle and experience? You know, and there's already seen some sporting good designs and, uh, and opportunities to kind of build upon that. Um, there's a, you know, uh, small business growth and entrepreneurship, and particularly, you know, in the current environment where there's a lot of churn and change uh, within businesses, uh, within small businesses, you're also seeing um, businesses move where they are uh, as, you know, more people are working remotely. Um, you know, the, the, the county is seen as a potential hub for kind of agriculture tech uh, and agriculture tech development, combining some of, the, you know, the agriculture uh, businesses within the area, along with some of the, um, you know, the talent in, in technology and information and communications. Um, retaining um, UC Santa Cruz students in the area in, in, in strengths of engineering, physics, and earth sciences, uh, and, you know, and developing opportunities for more centralized housing and public transit. Um, some of the threats to the area include natural disasters and other economic disturbances, including drought, wildfire, um, some of the, you know, some of the things that were just talked about earlier in terms of, uh, you know, proximity to the ocean. Uh, and um, uh, ocean sea level rise. Um, relatively high exposure to economic downturn, and we're you know, both from tourism and changes to, to household that debt to income ratio. Um, and a culture that is historically resistant to kind of growth of businesses within the community. You know, issues of income inequality, mobility, uh, rising cost of living with stagnant, stagnant wages and its, and its impact on, on homelessness. So these are some of the threats. Um, let's switch to the next slide. I hope I'm not going over time. Um, this is a slide that, really looks at one of the, the important things to understand uh, from the pandemic is it's really uneven impact on uh, on households and on businesses, both from a, you know, from a, a worker perspective, but also from an employer and an industry perspective, COVID-19 had really disparate impacts, depending on who you were. Uh, as a worker or as a business, you may have seen little to no impacts where you could have seen really kind of massive impacts. And we see that here just by income. And one of the, one of the scarier things, one of the more challenging things of the pandemic is, is, is if you were, you know, had a higher income, if you were, let's say your average income is over 60,000, um, you saw really little to no impact on total employment. We've actually updated these numbers since this, the, the presentation was originally produced. And that, you know, that 6% drop for higher income workers is now down to, you know, zero to 1%. It's really very, there's really no impact. They've recovered all those higher wage, higher paying positions. Um, but that lower income, uh, you know, those jobs that are making less than 27,000 a year, you know, and, you know, in this older slide, it said they had a loss of 34%. And, you know, since, you know, through June of 2021, it's still at 22%. So, you know, almost one in four lower income jobs that was there before the pandemic is not there now. 
Um, and again, these are the people that are likely to ha have that higher debt to income ratio and have less economic resilience. And, you know, I worry about issues related to homelessness, but just, you know, people falling through the cracks because the people that were hit hardest um, by employment loss tend to be low income workers. Next slide. Um, you know, one of the other interesting things uh, about the pandemic is we see higher unemployment but you're also seeing a real need. Employers are having a really hard time finding new workers. Well, how does that work? How do you have high unemployment uh, and, you know, and a real uh, labor shortage? And, and a lot of it is, is, is because of a skills gap, right? The positions that are needed, we don't have this thing, you know, the, the workforce that's employed doesn't have the skills um, that are able to really qualify for those positions. Um, and, you know, this, this labor force participation, so the, the black uh, line shows kind of just the California change in, in baseline. So labor force participation has impacted the entire state and, and in fact, it has impacted the entire country. But the, but the problem has been much more acute uh, in the, within Santa Cruz County and that labor force participation drop uh, has been even higher. Um, and yet, and, and what we're seeing is, is employers in Santa Cruz County are having an even harder time uh, finding workers, uh, particularly in um, some of the, you know, both higher paying, you know, technically skilled positions, but also even a lot of the population serving industries as well. So, uh, you know, it is definitely an interesting kind of conundrum uh, that, the, that the county is facing in some ways much more acutely than, than the state is as a whole. Next slide, please. Um, state of the workforce. So I'm, 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 we did also a kind of a follow-up report that came out a few months ago that looked at uh, and asked some of the key questions that are coming out, um, you know, of kind of the state of the world of work, you know, from the pandemic. Let's jump into the next slide. And so I'm trying to summarize a relatively, um, you know, robust report that looked at that. But we identified industries and communities and kind of greater distress. Uh, we looked at career pathways and some of the transitionary training and education um, as well as some of the immediate employment opportunities. So I identify those specific ones and look for and track changes in employment by industry cluster, some of the industry the economic distress by business and community, uh, and looked at some of the uh, education and training participation. Uh, LFPR is kind of uh, labor force participation rates and, and that, what that meant, and some of the changes in customer behavior and consumption patterns, and, and really work arrangements and entrepreneurship. All these things are things that we're, 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 we looked at and we're still looking at because they're still evolving, particularly as kind of, you know, the pandemic kind of goes up and down and, you know, kind of goes through. Uh, this, you know, these changes and the impacts it'll have both temporary, but also some of the longer term changes we expect uh, in terms of employment and economic behavior. Uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, so um, questions. Um, I think I'm, I think I've run out of time, but I'm happy to answer uh, any questions uh, about the different reports and, and uh, the economic development strategies. Thank you very much for that thorough report. Very interesting. And we're going to be considering the proposed operational plan for the next two years in the county with agenda item 14 today. And I'm encouraged uh, that many of the pro proposed objectives directly uh, address the weaknesses and threats of the uh, SEDS report uh, that's been identified. Um, number one, the debt to income, if I have a question, Santa Cruz County versus California, we're way up there. Is that because of the high cost of housing generally? Yeah, I mean, that, that's at least part of it, for sure. Um, you also tend to have, you know, a, a wage uh, deficit, or no, I shouldn't say, yeah, you tend to pay lower wages, but have a higher cost of living. Um, right. And that's one of the reasons why people tend to leave the, the county. Um, and that what I mean when I say lower wages, because the, the larger percentage of employment and things like tourism and agriculture, those tend to have below average earnings. Right. And because it may make up a larger percentage of your, you know, your the, the employment within the county, uh, it, it do, definitely makes it more costly to live here. So you have you have a higher cost of living, but a lower kind of overall wage profile. Uh, and, and that they, they, those add to that. And definitely housing is a, a, a big contributor to that. Housing and public transit here, but uh, we don't talk much about these other opportunities listed on uh, I think it's page 250 of the agenda packet. Uh, and I, you've mentioned uh, or addressed some of what I'm interested to know from staff if there's a, an organized process underway uh, for, to, for us to work with community partners such as UCSC to, you know, the hub of ag tech in particular, I'm thinking of doing it, and how we retain more UCSC uh, engineers and scientists. Um, 
that's going to be really important, I think, um, in trying to resolve or, or uh, improve this uh, outlook that we have in Santa Cruz County. Um, I would, before we go to the public, uh, any other questions from the board? I'll start with uh, Supervisor Caput. He has not Okay, uh, Supervisor Koenig, any questions? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just noted that we still lag in tier one jobs compared to the state overall. Um, you know, is there many specific strategies or recommendations for how we can increase uh, tier one jobs in the county? Yeah, no, it's a great question. The SEDS uh, report spends some time detailed in that, so I'm just gonna kind of outline that. But yeah, I mean, the, the key strategies are, are really threefold. Um, they're about improving and kind of expanding entrepreneurship uh, in, you know, in specific, in specific uh, sectors. You know, there are, um, you know, we, we've seen an increase in different, you know, research, information, communication technologies, um, some of these industry clusters that tend to pay higher wages uh, are, are an important part, uh, looking to retain and develop, you know, again, as, as I was just being told, the talent that is developed uh, in Santa Cruz, the, the problem is right now people come and get a great degree in engineering and physics or something in material sciences and then, and then leave. So how do you retain those people? Uh, and then also look for opportunities, you know, in some of these, you know, emerging uh, industries and clusters uh, as well as some of the potential infrastructure changes. I think increasing uh, bandwidth and things like that could have good support, education, training, but also, um, you know, opportunities for um, getting individuals, entrepreneurs to be more engaged or potentially more likely to, to grow within the area. Got it. And, and during um, the public input and community input, did you hear any continued need for uh, increased office space? I, I know I heard that at one point, but I think that might have been pre-pandemic. Is that still a need within our community? Yeah, I mean, office space is something, you know, I think one of the things that I didn't emphasize enough in my presentation is you want to spend time understanding the changes that are happening within your community. We're seeing you know, one important point is over the last 18 months, we've seen more change in the labor market and the economy than we did 10 years before that. And those changes are still occurring. And so one of the things we're seeing is we're seeing employers seeing requiring and asking for different times of office space. And you're seeing more like remote and small satellite offices that are connected to home and allow workers to come in and work at time, but, but maybe do more remote work. Right, and what does that mean in terms of bandwidth requirements? And what does that re mean for kind of office and space requirements? All those things are changing, but yeah, I would expect more satellite offices, more you know, uh, uh, rollover or change in the type of uh, office space that was demanded. We, answering your question directly, yes, there was a need for more office space kind of before when we started this process, but I'd want to look at that and re kind of reevaluate those numbers because there's been so much churn and change, you know, over the last six to 12 months in terms of what employers are looking for. Yeah. And then to your point about uh, fostering local entrepreneurship, I couldn't help but notice that uh, outlier in aviation and defense, uh, presumably is that Joby Aviation that uh, contributed to that or there were there other um, so yeah, I mean, the, the air taxis are definitely part of that. And there is more than just Joby's one, but there, there are others as well. But it's also research and drones. And there's it, it's a really kind of niche -y kind of interesting area that, that we probably should explore a little bit more. Um, but I will say it's volatile. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing where we, you know, we need to kind of make sure, meaning that data was from 2019. So I'd want to reevaluate where it is in kind of the middle of 2021. And those those kind of innovative industries tend to change uh, relatively quickly. So I, I want to update that and see where it is. But that is definitely an area, those air taxis and some of the research around drones. And even we're seeing some new work in terms of energy and water, um, you know, an infrastructure that can potentially provide and increase some of those tier one jobs as well. Thanks. And then um, were there any specific strategies for ag tech? development? I mean, I know it's uh, certainly on all our minds, especially given the number of uh, local employees that are currently engaged in the agri agricultural industry. And so obviously any way that we can uh, increase ag tech and hopefully uh, increase their pay as well at the same time would be great. Um, so any specific- Yeah, I mean, I think there? there's there's kind of two strategies around ag tech. For one, it's, it's, it's really trying to connect the supply chain and really the value, you know, in ag tech is is, is as long as, you know, the more that the local agriculture producers can really go further along and package and develop and really connect to markets, um, the more they can retain the kind of the, uh, the revenue that comes in from that. So rather than selling kind of raw commodities, you know, they're selling niche and organized, you know, 
you know, boxes of, or bags of arugula. It's all ready to go, right? And maybe arugula is not the best example or strawberries, whatever it is, but really connecting to that supply chain and developing it and then using and developing a lot of the technologies around uh, tracking weather changes and, and, you know, the more automating and, and, you know, the connecting to the big data that is improving kind of the efficiency and productivity of agriculture uh, would be valuable. Um, you know, the ag tech is an area where I really think you almost want to be regional because this is something where Santa Cruz, Monterey, you know, even San Luis Obispo at some level, they're all working to and looking to connect your supply chain regionally uh, as best you can and connect with the kind of the technology innovators that are in this area would be a good thing. One last question. Um, I understand this report was re required uh, by the federal government. Can we, does it uh, allow us now to apply for specific grants um, to, to fund specific portions of the plan or uh, you know, how, well, how does that process work? Yeah, so what the, I, I, I gave you kind of information on kind of two reports. So the first one and the majority of really the presentation was the SEDS, which is the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. And yes, it's exactly like you said, it's a requirement to be able to apply for uh, US EDA or Economic Development uh, Assistance, you know, Department of Commerce uh, grants. Uh, and so it does basically allows you over the next through 2024 uh, to, to apply for any grants that are relevant um, you know, for your, for your county. Uh, and it provides some of the framework for, you know, how you would evaluate, you know, potential grants and, you know, maybe some of your priorities for that. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor yeah. Friend. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the presentation. I have no additional questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I guess, um, uh, the, the data was helpful. What strikes me is, um, is, is how small a county we are and how interconnected we are. And so, um, you know, a couple different founders decisions to build or grow their company here has profound impacts <clears throat> on the data that we're seeing. Um, and so I think, you know, overall we're subject to these macro trends that are hard for a county our size to, to really influence. However, I think um, working collaboratively across the different jurisdictions uh, and coming up with some micro policies and targets, um, I th it shows it shows the impacts it can make, right? Um, and so uh, I want to I think going forward, thinking how we work collaboratively across the jurisdictions to have a unified approach to economic development um, will be will be really essential as many of these firms and workers are moving across lines or the workers who uh, previously are part of the 16% leaving the county uh, may be staying here and um, and when they they shift uh, most of their week to here you could you could see it at an economic benefit um, and a civic benefit and a cultural benefit uh, to having those folks not be in cars and right. environmental benefit. So I, um, I, what strikes me is just the importance of cross uh, jurisdictional collaboration and being aware that, you know, a couple firm's decisions can have a pretty big impact on the overall economic picture uh, of our community. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great comment. I would also say, I mean, they've done research on this. It's really good. There's a, I forget his name. He's a, a professor out of Cal Berkeley. Uh, and they've kind of estimated that, you know, things like biotechnology and some of these innovative industries like air taxis, for every job you generate in Santa Cruz, there's a five job multiplier, right? And it really has a big impact on incre increasing those tier one jobs. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you can think about every job that you create in an industry like biotechnology or information communication technology or these drone or these, you know, these higher ag tech, they can generate five additional jobs. Uh, and of those five jobs, maybe one or two of them are tier three, but the other, you know, three are tier one or tier two, two, two occupations. Okay, that, that, thank you. Okay, I, I do uh, appreciate your enthusiasm. Uh, really great. Um, any questions from the public? There are no speakers on Zoom. Okay, I think the proper thing would just to accept the report. Um, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, sir. Well, I figured I'm here. I might as well comment. Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Uh, I'm going to quote two people right now. Figures don't lie, but with statistics and averages, the shallow focused sure can figure. And I'm quoting Catherine Austin Fitz, who once ran HUD. 
And Lena Pugh, who has made lots of different observations as far as the frequency weapons that are so rampant here. You know, this county's development, talking about available office space and business space, there's available office and business space everywhere. All you gotta do is walk down any street and open your eyes. Businesses have been destroyed due to what's been going on here the past year and a half. Um, as far as innovation and supply chains, you look at what's going on in the United States and what's going on in the world, but to focus on what's going on in the United States, farmers are being paid 130% of their value for their crops to destroy those crops and an additional $600 per acre if they literally cut down their crops with some little mower. So that's my two cents for this. I'm waiting to comment on some other things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any comments? Virtually. There's now one comment. Kathleen and Woody, your microphone is available. Um, I also had not expected to uh, see this presentation and comment on it. Uh, it was definitely a, a very vivid documentation of the gentrification of Santa Cruz County. Um, I, you know, I think it's useful to bear in mind that if those tier one workers can't afford to live here, they will leave whether there's a job for them or not. Even the middle class um, cannot afford, our teachers and our nurses and a lot of other middle class workers cannot afford to live here, neither by buying a house nor by renting a house or an apartment. So the housing is key. Uh, but also I'm really intrigued by this uh, interest that you have in ag tech. Uh, because uh, we believe, especially here from the viewpoint of the Pajaro Valley, that this is a vibrant agricultural community and that our county and our valley could be a, a model and a mecca for training in ag tech. Ag tech that would reduce pesticide use, that it would improve working conditions, that would uh, allow us to produce those value-added products that come from this valley, a branding mechanism, and also uh, increase the quality of our tourist options, uh, being outdoors in beautiful farms, as well as on our beautiful coastline and in our redwoods. So we have a vision for this community that would incorporate a whole lot of economic trends that would value our natural resources, including our soil, and also have a positive impact on our climate change that would draw down carbon instead of releasing it. So really look at ag tech and look at the agro, ag, the, or farmers in general, and also in the local availability of good food and not having it all be shipped elsewhere. So please consider that vision when you look at this economic picture. We need to grow our own food. There are no other speakers on Zoom. Okay, um, we're charged to the board. I think uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to accept the report. That'd I'll be move to, if, if I don't know uh, necessary. It's really, just, go ahead. I'll move to approve. Okay. Uh, I just wanted Second. to say thanks. Uh, thanks, Josh, for the report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Pardon me, Supervisor. This is just a study session. Okay. Yes. So we really don't have to accept There's no it. vote required. We, um, we don't have to. Okay. Okay, formal. Okay, well, thank you for your presentation. Very much uh, appreciated. Uh, a lot of work to do. We have a, we have some. Uh, good opportunities as well. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move uh, for the last uh, pre-lunch item, so to speak, uh, tw um, 12.1, which was item 24, to approve responses to findings and recommendations of the three 2020-21 uh, Santa Cruz County Civil <laughs> Grand Jury reports and take related actions as re uh, recommended by the County Administrative Officer. Supervisor Caput, you pulled this item. Um, do you like to uh, open the discussion, please? You bet. And uh, what I'll do is, uh, rather than dwell on each specific item that I'm going to talk about, I'll just throw it all out there and see uh, uh, what we can do at the end. Um, I w first want to say Juan Hidalgo has done a uh, wonderful job as the uh, uh, county uh, ag commissioner. All 58 counties in California have to have an uh, agriculture uh, commission commissioner. 
and uh, we're fortunate to have Juan Hidalgo on our, on our side. Uh, he not only has uh, that office and a very small staff, but he has uh, also vector control and uh, weights and measures uh, that are that can be explained later. But uh, that's a a big responsibility also. Um, the grand jury uh, they looked at this, and I I know with the grand jury reports uh, they focus on certain areas and look and try to solve problems in a certain area. Uh, they're looking at it as one item. Uh, each individual on the grand jury might have a specialty. And uh, uh, so I, I, I give a lot of credit and a lot of weight to the argument of the uh, grand jury because uh, they're able to focus on something that as a board of supervisors, uh, we're hit with maybe a hundred different items and we can't sometimes just focus on one item. Uh, it comes down to funding. I know uh, with uh, Juan Hidalgo's staff, uh, he has a very small staff. So to ask him to do even more is, uh, is something that would be very tough. I did see in there <clears throat> on the, in the item that uh, we can at least lobby the state to uh, for funds in order to uh, help every ag commissioner in all, in all 58 counties in California. But uh, we could join together with other counties and lobby the state to have better notification of pesticide use and uh, some funding for the office in order to uh, focus on that. So we, that's one thing we can do, lobby by letters and support by the Board of Supervisors. Um, I'd like to see uh, study sessions and uh, neighborhood meetings to talk about uh, people's concerns, in, uh, especially in the Watsonville area. Uh, Bronte is a... Uh, uh, in the uh, senior village area, and uh, their uh, their homes back up on Bronte, right uh, on uh, agricultural land, and uh, they uh, brought that to my concern, uh, to my attention, that uh, certain times out of the year, this is in the past. I think we've resolved the problem with that, you know, but. Uh, they they would wake up in the morning and uh, their windows would be open uh, during the night and uh, they would be able to smell some kind of, you know, pesticides being used. And they said that they had no idea that uh, pesticides were going to be uh, applied in that area. So uh, notice is a, is a key thing. And... Uh, you know, it could be done online and also, I guess the state also does put out uh, notification, but it's not as a specific to certain neighborhoods that uh, people want to know uh, basically in what general area. Uh, I know some of the, uh, uh, the farms out there don't have an address and it's hard to specifically pinpoint exactly where, where they are going to apply pesticide. But uh, we uh, locally, we know, and the farmers know, uh, landmarks or certain areas that we can focus on within a quarter mile. I guess a quarter mile uh, specific sites are the schools, uh, especially. Uh, the state at one time was pushing to have that a, a one mile, uh, which would be, uh, impossible to uh, to do because almost every school is within a mile or two of each other and uh, the notification would be very difficult but the quarter mile is certainly something I think we can do uh, on our website or on some kind of notification uh, I you know protecting uh, the health and uh, the neighborhoods that or the people that we represent is a, is a very big issue.
And I'd rather see us uh, err on the side of trying to do too much rather than just doing the minimum. So I, I'd like us to really get out there and actually look at this and uh, uh, somehow, uh, like I said, with uh, landmarks, uh, getting notification out, uh, if, if need be, uh, if the money is there, even sending out some letters in advance. I know with the schools, uh, what they've been doing now <clears throat> when they apply pesticide uh, near a school, uh, they try to do it on a Saturday morning very early. And uh, so by Monday, uh, basically the, uh, the pesticide is, you know, not uh, as dangerous, I guess. Uh, for the school kids. And uh, the other problem we have also, we have the drift, the wind, and everything that does carry the pesticides in certain areas. So what I, what I would like to see is <clears throat> that we look at this uh, issue uh, after we have neighborhood meetings and get public input and, uh, and focus on it a little more. I know we can't uh, alone solve the problem, uh, you know, but we can certainly uh, push to make everything better. So I would, I, would like, <clears throat> I would like to put it on a future agenda where we have the actually uh, have someone from the grand jury, the, maybe the person who focused on, or the people uh, on the grand jury that focused on the pesticide use, uh, have them come and uh, speak to the board and uh, we can get uh, a discussion going, like I said, on making things better uh, for neighborhoods and, uh, and for farm workers. So um, I, I know uh, the state uh, tw over 20 years ago, uh, they uh, put out a ban on methyl bromide and they gave uh, the farms like uh, four to five years in order to come up with an alternative. Well, 20 years went by. They kept extending it and say five more years, five more years. And pretty soon it was over 20 when they finally got rid of uh, methyl bromide. So I, I don't want to see that happen in uh, our community. Uh, district one and district four, my district, we represent more than 75% of all the agriculture in Santa Cruz County uh, in, in our area. So uh, my, I guess my motion is to put, to actually put on the agenda where we have the grand jury and we have a discussion on what is the most we can possibly do and how we can lobby the state for funds if we need it and lobby the state to make uh, uh, protective measures for neighborhoods and uh, schools and children, of course, and uh, also uh, neighborhood schools and uh, pretty much cover oh, the farm workers. Yeah. And then now you yeah, open it up. If anybody wants to second that, that'd be great. <laughs> that how we might address that uh mr palacios um we could we could consider that for an agenda item in the future yeah we can certainly um discuss how we would want to do um do that in the future and handle it i know that there's also an opportunity to do some community meetings as an as a either an addition or um uh, to a study session and so we'll certainly uh, can, can speak to supervisor caput and uh, see how to come back in the future with uh, his request That'd be great. And, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll come up with a date later. I'm going to have uh, two new uh, neighborhood meetings in uh, my district near schools. And uh, we'll have Juan Hidalgo and his staff and uh, others uh, from the county probably uh, show how we're trying to do the most we can. I know a lot of things, the state is uh, responsible for it. But uh, we can certainly lobby, we can certainly push uh, the state to move uh, faster 
and we can somehow talk about how to make our notification here in our areas uh, better. Thank you. Tony. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't. Um, I had a question for our agricultural commissioner. Uh, I don't know if you could approach the uh, the stand. Um, it's, you know, uh, this issue. Um, I've, I've heard a little bit about it as well from some constituents. Um, I guess uh, I, it seems like there's the uh, farming safely near schools pilot project that has been launched in northern Monterey County. Um, what are the opportunities to simply extend that pilot to uh, to include por portions of our county or all of our county? Um, you know, have you evaluated that? Do you have any sense of the cost? Uh, good afternoon, Chair, members of the board, Juan Hidalgo, Agricultural Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Super Supervisor. That's a good question. Uh, that pilot program in Monterey County was uh, funded by uh, state funds. And that uh, program in particular is to provide notification about uh, use of pesticides, of specific pesticides, what we call California restricted pesticides, which is a small group of pesticides here in California, uh, when those materials were to be applied within a quarter of a mile of uh, certain schools. Um, I think their pilot program includes three schools in the Power Valley Unified School District, and I think they have some other schools in, in the North uh, Monterey County School District. But that's what that project is about specifically, just to uh, members of the public could sign up uh, to receive that information. And again, it's just for use of those materials within a quarter of a mile. One of the things that Santa Cruz County has done for many, many years now, uh, well over two decades, is that we have had a, not a similar notification program with the Power Valley Unified School District. So whenever there's to be um, uh, soil fumigation, which is a particular type of hazardous material that our growers use to kill soil pathogens before planting in, in our county, whenever they're gonna use one of those materials, we send a five-day notification to the school district. So we have had a really good working relationship with the school district to do essentially the same. And the way it works is that we provide that information to the school district and the district sends the information to the impacted schools, uh, the, sends the information to the teachers, the principal, and my understanding is that they post that information so that parents at that school can also receive the same information. And coming back to your question, Supervisor, I have not explored the opportunity for that pilot program with Monterey County. That was a, a pilot program. My understanding is that the funding from the state did dry up. So I think the county is continuing that program to some extent. However, I think it is the county that's uh, picking up the cost of, of continuing that, that program for the community there. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Juan. Uh, I appreciate uh, everything you're doing. And uh, I, I, your office also has to investigate uh, if somebody goes to the hospital and complains about feeling ill or whatever. Uh, that's a big uh, burden on you also. And I, I don't know, how many do you have on your staff? Uh, you have a very small staff. Let's just kind of move forward with the, uh, you know, the direction we might have, but uh, or you can say how many you have in your staff, but I think uh, Supervisor Koenig has another question. Too. How many staff members? Uh, yes, we have a small staff supervisor. We have during the summer months about 30 people, during the winter months about 20 people, and specifically about uh, four of those staff work primarily in the pesticide use enforcement program. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Coney, you got any uh, questions? Yeah, thank you, Chair. No further questions. Actually, just oh. um, you know, it seems like that's potential there to potentially build on uh, or expand that pilot program in the future if we can identify appropriate funds. Um, and thank you for your current work with the school district. Um, and uh, you know maybe our work can also inform and improve uh, the work done in Monterey County so far. Okay, hey, you might just end, uh, any other questions from board members? Mr. Chair, I have a brief question of, Ms., of Mr. Hidalgo. Uh, I am I'm definitely supportive of of uh, Supervisor Caput hosting some community meetings down in his district um, in the South County. I, I think that that a question from Mr. Hidalgo is realistically, I mean, most of these are state regulated and most of these are not within the board's purview. Um, I say this because I'm, I think it's it, one of the important things in government is, is not uh, creating an expectation of, of what we can or cannot do by hosting something like a, a um, study session based on this. I mean, even Supervisor Cabot's own point was that this is about advocacy to the state. So um, can you just 
explain the regulatory environment that, that this exists in and where the board's authority sort of starts and ends, where your authority starts and ends, and how the state regulatory environment is? Because I'm supportive of community outreach. I'm, I'm just more hesitant about having an extensive board discussion over something where I don't have any authority to actually effectuate anything. Friend, yeah, the, the, there is some limitations between what my office is able to enforce locally. This is uh, the regulation of pesticides is at the state level, and my job is to enforce pesticide regulations locally. Uh, any changes to state regulations definitely lies with the state. Uh, I know that there's, um, you know, just an interest to receive notification from some of our community members. We're not the only county where uh, there's communities asking for the same. And I think, you know, in the report, um, I included some brief information that the state is already looking at this issue. There's already a lot of uh, meetings uh, already taking place with some stakeholders. Uh, and there's going to be more meetings in the future to get that um, public information, public uh, comment as to what the community would like to see for uh, a statewide uh, notification program. And realistically, I think that's where this issue better lies, just to be consistent, just to have equity across the state so that there's no two counties doing and providing information that is not the same, that cr can create some confusion. Um, so the state is already um, looking at this issue and in fact they have allocated 10 million dollars this fiscal budget uh to begin to have those community meetings all right thank you then, then it sounds like the better place for this to land would be actually for the board requesting that the state hold one of those community meetings be it virtual or in person here within our county as opposed to the board itself hosting a, a study session directly and that it should be held in in the area most impacted which would be really the southern port or eastern portion of my district and, and then the outside area there of supervisor caput's district so I mean, I'm supportive of Supervisor Capita. Well, A, I'm supportive of moving forward with this item actually as it is, but uh, I, I would say that if there's additional direction, it should be um, about uh, if the board needs to do an outreach to invite the state to host such an outreach meeting, we should, or it could be part and parcel with the community meetings you're doing down below uh, or down um, in the South County below um, where some of these other issues are happening. And also, I think the school district should also be invited as part of this. They've been very receptive in conversations I've had with them on this issue. Anyway, I'm sure you too. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. I, I, and I uh, understand, uh, Juan, uh, there's only so much we can do. The state actually uh, does uh, has regulations and uh, they do the enforcement and things like that. I guess what I'd like to see, we focus on this more rather than uh, just giving it a, a minimum of uh, attention. And then maybe we can get Monterey County uh, and San Benito County to join us in putting some pressure on the state in order to help us get this notification out. We should be able to do that. Uh, you know, notification's a key uh, to the thing. And I, I think uh, also uh, you understand which pesticides are allowed in the, you know, to be used and which ones aren't and which safety procedures have to be followed. So, yeah, I just don't want to find out later that uh, people in a certain neighborhood uh, or in a certain area are farm workers or people living near a farm, uh, they're, they're ending up in a hospital uh, with some kind of, uh, you know, calamity that, uh, we did. We, I don't want us to ignore that, and we, we see it on television a lot. Uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden, Roundup is bad for you, Paraquat is bad for you. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I'd rather we're at the forefront. Yeah. Mr. Hidalgo, in that effort. Uh, any other questions from the board? Uh, Kuderdi, any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, we oh, just yeah. would be, uh, we need a motion to accept. Pardon you have a chair. comment, Mr. You'd have to uh, take public comment yeah. now. Oh, excuse uh, me. With the reminder that anybody who already spoke on this item um, in their early public comment that they uh, cannot speak again. Yes, right. Uh, but if somebody has not had a chance to speak, uh, there would be. Anybody a would comment. like to address us on this issue who hasn't addressed this before? Yeah. 
Right. Hi, my name is James. I don't think I'm going to repeat anything that I've said before or what I want to comment on. On number 13, uh, I'm very pleased that this is available for public comment and wasn't just one of the rubber stamped uh, consent agenda items. Number 24, approve responses to findings and recommendations for the 2020-2021 Santa Cruz County civil grand jury reports and take related actions as recommended by the county administrative officer. Out of the 17 pages, that was two and a half lines. Number 24 is actually 108 pages. It's from 567 to 675, some information that I will familiarize myself with later. Nothing about this report had anything to do with, and now I need to be careful with my language. Um, Huh. What's the definition of allopathic medicine? Treat symptoms and diseases using drugs, radiation, and surgery. How is neuropathic medicine different? It uses all those same procedures, but it um, focuses on what's going in your body and what could be going in your body to affect your overall state of health. Um, Anyway, I want to be careful with what I want to say on number 13 and be respectful. Um, but I'm glad that there was so much information that was provided to everybody. And I certainly will familiarize myself with that 108 pages of the 1,575 pages that are being, that are being put forth today. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, board supervisors. My name is Hector Calderon. Uh, I live in Santa Cruz County. And the reason that I'm here today is that there was a civil grand jury report that was produced, um, which Safe Ag Safe Schools uh, local coalition wanted to comment, uh, commend um, the civil grand jury for having chosen the subject matter as one of the investigations looking into the inner workings of the county, one of which looked at the pesticide notifications which our county leaders throughout the county um, continue working tirelessly to push our county ag commissioner Juan Hidalgo's um, office to simply web uh, post the web postings of growers notices of intent um, to apply restrictive pesticides that would be a simple way to give uh, public information to the general public and yet um, I'm here because as a part of Safe Act Safe Schools, we have um, expressed extreme disappointment on how the Board of Supervisors have um, you know, responded to the given report around pesticide notifications was to simply you know, pass the onus off of the Ag Commissioner and onto the State Department of Pesticide Regulations, which is um, we know that the, the grand jury took some time, uh, a really long time to really produce that report. And while the board has simply just dismissed this matter is even more concerning. We know that community, community and people pay with their health, especially farm worker families and communities of color that live closer to these fields, specifically in the South County of Santa Cruz, knowing that Latinx communities are overly ex, um, affected through environmental racism that exist and thrive in historically mon, uh, marginalized communities. And we believe that the public has the right to know about these applications of highly restricted pesticides that the county ag commissioner um, must at the very least be able to post these notices of intent. Um, and it's also just because as a community, we have that right to know. So simply, um, you know, I know that there was a lot of disgust here in terms of what the board, um, the Ag Commissioner had came to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? I have one speaker, two speakers oh, two on Zoom. Speakers. Okay. Kathleen Kilpatrick, your microphone is available. So uh, I'm not sure if I can speak or not, but there is another speaker at this location. Well, um, yeah, is, is Woody there also, Kathleen? Yes, Woody's here also, and will yeah, I be Woody. able to speak? Let her yeah. speak. Let her speak. Okay. okay I just wanted. I, I just want to say that that uh, there are some issues that were raised by this discussion uh, with the supervisors, and uh, Woody's going to talk about the live example of what's happening in our neighborhood. I do want to say that that we have had pretty good communications with uh, with Juan Hidalgo, and that our our senior neighborhood 
got a special exemption from the usual lack of information and we are getting informed of some of the pesticides. But uh, just like the school notification program, uh, it's not really set up to give people a timely and appropriate amount of information about what's going on in our neighborhoods and in our schools. And um, I think that the supervisors really need <coughs> to hear more about the flaws in that particular system, the school notification, which we believe was uh, built to fail in Monterey County. And then, you know, you also need to understand the needs of our senior communities and our other vulnerable populations. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think supporting the lobbying is a really great thing to do, but we also still feel like a pilot project in this county is doable. It's part of that ag tech development that we were just talking about in the last segment and that we have capable people here who could help our county uh, come up with some models that would inform the state in their work toward making this a universal thing. We already don't have uh, equity or uh, consistency. We have a better ag commissioner than most and this is a worse problem in other counties. Vladimir Zuman, your microphone is available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, my name is Michael Gassera. I had a different account's name on my... I, I represent an organization called Science for the People, a national organization, as well as the local regional organization, Safe Ag, Safe Schools. And uh, the, the issue is really very simple. Uh, the science is clear first. The science uh, tells us that dangerous pesticides are still being used in California and that drift leads those pesticides to people beyond farm workers in the communities that surround the fields. Most recently, research out of UCLA has shown clear connections between pesticide drift and childhood cancers from up to eight different pesticides that are used in Santa Cruz County. And so, um, until these pesticides are banned, which hopefully will happen down the line, people need to be informed. This is about the right to know. This simply is the issue of the agricultural commissioner making available the notices of intent that the growers have to submit. It's not uh, a big deal. It's not something expensive and difficult to do. Um, it, it's about having people know what's being done so they have at least a chance to do something about it. It is also, as Hector Calderon said, a clear case of environmental racism. The people affected by this are people in communities around farms, as well as farm, farm workers, children in schools that are near the farms. These children are largely people of color. And so that's what's going on here. The issue is not that complicated. The science is clear. What needs to be done is clear. And we in Safe Ag Safe Schools don't understand why this is not happening. Thank you. There are no other speakers on Zoom. Okay, I'll return it to the board. Um, for, um, a motion to accept the, uh, or to approve item number 12.1. Did you have another comment, Mr. Palacios? No, okay. Uh, entertain a motion to approve. Item number 24, or now 12.1, do I have a motion? Move the recommended action. Uh, okay. okay. Call the roll, please. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, second? I did not happen. No. I, uh, right. I'm going to vote for it, but I'm going to vote no on part of it. I, uh, I wrote it down here somewhere. Well, you got to be either yes or no. It's, um, <laughs> well, uh, no, uh, but we're going to put it on the agenda uh, in the future to focus on this. Right. That's the okay. Call the recommended action. Supervisor uh, Koenig. No, Ms. Mr. Chair, just to clarify, the recommended actions are not to put this on a future agenda. The recommended actions are the actions that are listed within the board that item. Is, that is true. Just to accept the grand jury reports and what was presented to the board, uh, we, and we know that there was. Go ahead. Yeah, and then Supervisor Kevin was I, I Actually, uh, I'd like to if I put an amendment. We put it off to vote on it when we get more information from the grand jury. 
and uh, neighborhood meetings. So, so I mean, I don't, I don't consider that. A, I mean, I'm not trying to discourage the neighborhood meetings, but I don't consider that a friendly amendment. We're here to consider whether or not we approve our response to the grand jury. What's been the consideration of your additional information? The CAO had said that he would work with you individually to help set those things up or to potentially come back to the board if that was warranted. But the item before us right now is not specifically to bring something back to the board. And I would be willing to work with you too, uh, just as far as inviting the state goes to try and hold one of those community meetings uh, with the state that, this, that uh, Mr. Hidalgo said that the state has funding for Monterey County, our county, and, and the school district in the neighborhood, neighborhoods down there. But, but, this, but, but my motion is just for the current recommended actions. Uh, can Supervisor Caput? It was hard uh, to uh, Supervisor uh, coming. No. You don't want to su second it? Do I have a su Who's no. the second? I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to vote no on the, uh, only because uh, I, I think we, in order to vote on it correctly, we need more information. There's a motion by Supervisor Friend. Was there a second? I did not catch the second. Is there a second? Uh, all second. Second by Supervisor Koenig. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. No. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes 4-1. Okay. Uh, Chair McPherson, um, we're running a little bit late uh, according yeah. to our schedule. Uh, I might suggest that we start closed session at one o'clock and then we start the afternoon session at two o'clock. Okay. We if will, that's um, acceptable. Okay. We will go into closed set. We'll recess to go into closed session uh, at one o'clock. One o'clock. And uh, return for the regular items number 13 and 14 at two o'clock. All right. Yes, I think that will give us enough time. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. We're only missing Caput. Okay, I'd like to call um, uh, the, the meeting of the August 24th, 2021 afternoon session, uh, 2 p.m. of the County Board, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to order. We will open with um, scheduled item on uh, vaccination requirements for county staff. Um, we did have to delay this until two o'clock because the morning session went a little longer. So um, we'll open this up at this point. And I think um, Mr. I think Carlos Palacios and is Dr. Newell going to be presented to or will you, Carlos? Yes, uh, yes I'll be um, speaking on this item. And I believe uh, we'll have um, Ajita Patel available as well um, for questions as well as I think Dr. Newell uh, is also going to be available uh, for questions. So uh, I'm bringing this item to you because there are continuing um, an ongoing assessment of the business operations of both government and private businesses to ensure the safety and welfare of staff and those we serve. A number of um, counties, including the state of California, have recently issued um, vaccine mandates for their employees. And there have been two general types of mandates, one uh, including um, Monterey County and now uh, Santa Clara County, I think San Francisco as well, uh, have a vaccine mandate for all county employees uh, that, and there's no alternative. Um, other uh, counties um, such as San Benito and, and others in the Bay Area 
have issued mandates with an option uh, that employees could, if they don't agree to get vaccinated, they could actually uh, agree to get tested once weekly. Um, so uh, based on that, we've um, done a survey of our employees and found that 85% of our county employees are currently vaccinated. Uh, we hope in the next uh, survey that we will be up around 90%, but it appears that there still be approximately 10% of our employees who uh, have still are choosing not to get vaccinated. So I have uh, decided to bring to the board today uh, three options um, to deal uh, with with this issue that other, as I said, other private businesses, uh, the federal government, state government, and other county and state city governments are dealing with. Uh, option one would be to maintain the status quo. That would be to do nothing and just encourage voluntary compliance with vaccination. This is, uh, as I said, we're at 85% now. We hope to get within 90% uh, within the next couple of weeks. A uh, second option would be uh, a mandatory vaccination for all county employees with, with no uh, alternative. And ag again, I said there are some uh, businesses that have done this. This applies to some of our health employees right now, given the state order. Um, and so it's certainly an option, uh, especially now that the federal government has uh, completed their certification of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, the third option, is to allow, is to require vaccinations for employees, but for those who are refused to get vaccinated, to give them the option of a mandatory weekly testing option. And, um, and that would be the third option. And uh, staff, um, including uh, myself and our personnel uh, director, uh, recommend option number three at this time. Um, the, um, main issue is how do we um, keep our employees safe? And we believe uh, the testing option does provide, does definitely increase the number, uh, the safe environment of our, our workforce. And also there are operational and, and legal issues with requiring a vaccination and without an alternative. Uh, given um, the um, laws that our employees are subject to and the due process rights they have, entering into discipline over someone who is not, uh, refuses to get vaccinated could be a very lengthy and difficult process. And so um, for that reason, mainly from our point of view, from a operational and legal point of view, uh, we are recommending option number three, where we would have a, a testing option for uh, county employees with a mandatory vaccination policy. Uh, however, we will do whatever the board uh, would like to do. I know it's a difficult policy decision. And I know different county governments and different businesses have come down on both sides of the issue of whether to require uh, vaccines with or without a testing option. Uh, with that, I will um, end my report. And I believe um, county council is available, uh, uh, the county health officer, Dr. Newell, and I believe Ajita Patel is also available as well. If there are any questions for staff. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Palacios. Uh, this is an issue that's certainly uh, not, isn't gonna please them all no matter what we choose. And so, um, but I think a decision does have to be made. And I think your recommendation is, is right on target. It does give some options. Uh, it, it encur it's an encouragement as well as an option. And so I think that's, that's a fair offer, so to speak. Um, any other, any comments from the board before we go to the public? Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I just have some questions. Uh, I think this would probably be best directed to the health officer uh, if she's available. Um, but uh, can, I'd, I'd love some clarification of the difference um, between uh, transmission of the virus uh, between people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. Is there a significant difference that we're seeing um, between folks who are unvaccinated versus vaccinated trans, uh, transmitting the virus? There's about a seven-fold increase of infection rates in unvaccinated compared to vaccinated. Um, once infected, however, vaccinated and unvaccinated transmit the same amount of virus for generally the same period of time. 
seven times more likely to be infected if they're unvaccinated. Correct, and they may not even know it, so they may come to work, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated. Many infected people are asymptomatic and they may come to work not knowing that they're um, infectious and then uh, spread the disease to coworkers. Got it. And then given uh, our recent uh, mask mandate indoors, um, you know, what additional uh, public safety benefits does it provide to uh, have a um, vaccine mandate like this? I mean, aren't we already, you know, pretty effectively preventing spread within the workplace with, with masks? Masks are just one layer of protection. Vaccine is probably the most important and definitely the most effective layer of protection of our county health workforce. And that goes for not just other employees, but with the public as well. So it's much safer to have more of our uh, workforce vaccinated. With option three, uh, providing uh, the, the testing option, uh, would, we, would we provide testing at all of at every place of county employment or what, what testing sites would we offer? We are, uh, we're working on the logistics of that uh, right now. So if the, the board were to choose option three, what we would do is more than likely we would have a few sites in both North and South County where people would come and get tested once a week and we'd have certain days when employees were required to, um, to come to work and uh, get tested first thing. Okay, and, and then I know that some private employers, um, I haven't heard of any public, but um, are requiring testing at the employee's expense. Uh, have, have we considered that option or are there legal issues with that option? There's uh, our HR director, maybe she can address that yeah, question. Yeah, happy to, happy to address that. So one of the things that we're currently looking at just for convenience on the testing is that we are trying to have a mobile vendor who will actually come to our work sites. And so we'll make it convenient so that employees may do that at the job site, which in essence will equate to, they'll be doing it during work time. And there would be no cost, hopefully there'd be no cost to the county or the employee. It would be um, either billed, uh, we hope it would be billed to insurance, to health insurance. So I can explain about the vendor that we're looking at working with. And this is a vendor that the city of Capitola and Santa Cruz are currently using. The vendor has an ability to bill for insurance, which means that we wouldn't have a cost. We have also asked the question, if for any reason an employee doesn't have insurance, let's say they're not using utilizing our county insurance, and they don't have any, which I think that's probably not a reality. Um, they also have a way to bill through federal mechanisms. So they are letting us know that there wouldn't be a cost. And we have reviewed a preliminary contract agreement, which also indicates no cost to the county. Well, that's incredible. Yes, and that's why we're, we're currently making sure, dotting our I's and crossing T's to ensure that that is so. Awesome. Um, and then I've, I've heard some concerns about uh, medical privacy. I mean, is there any way that you know, is it, these people who are doing the testing, are they going to be lining up in front of the building? And so it'll be obvious, you know, who has chosen, chosen to uh, vaccinate and who hasn't? So the idea would be that we certainly would have a window of time. So I would like to think that we will not have a big line forming. Our goal would be that not everybody can come at the same time. So we would have a window, right? Like we probably have a morning session, an afternoon session. And I think that would help uh, eliminate that line view and it shouldn't be an impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then my last question again is for the health officer, which is, um, you know, with the Delta variant, uh, you know, Lambda and, and uh, any other variants of concern, um, are we seeing increased infections uh, in children, uh, the folks who you know, cannot willingly be vaccinated? Or, or I should say, I mean, obviously, uh, I should uh, comp inf infections that require uh, children to go to the to the hospital. We haven't seen any of those type of infections here during the Delta surge, thank goodness, um, and we hope that we don't. 
Um, but it, we are seeing more cases in children. Perhaps it's because we're identifying more with uh, schools reopening, um, but we are definitely uh, recording more cases among unvaccinated children. And the more we can get our adults vaccinated, our eligible community members, the better for our children as well and for keeping our schools open. So uh, with um, Monterey County and Santa Clara County now doing, going to a full, uh, full mandate without the testing option, um, does the fact that Pfizer is, uh, the Pfizer vaccine is fully approved uh, make that any more legally viable uh, or are there continued concerns if we went that route? Well, I think it makes it, it, makes it more legally viable. Generally, uh, we still haven't seen a case yet uh, uh, that discusses public employment and what the due process uh, rights are involving um, bargaining impacts and things like that with regard to public employment. So there are issues that we have to deal with that there, but it is, it is a, uh, a, a legally viable option, which is why it was one of the options that is presented to you. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Any other qu uh, questions from the board? Uh, second District Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I, I have more some comments than, than questions. Um, and, and first, let me just say how proud I am of the, of the workforce, the county workforce that we have this level of vaccination already, which is higher than the community at large in most places in the state. And for that matter, most places in, in the country. So, I mean, we should be proud of the fact that, um, that county employees are, uh, we're not just telling the community to get vaccinated, we're also individually doing it and taking a leadership role on that. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of that 85, that we've, we've got that, that kind of number. Uh, with that said, I think that with the approval of, of the Pfizer vaccine, with the president's comments yesterday encouraging uh, vaccine mandates, um, I understand the rationale for number three, and I get it. I, I'm actually inclined to support number two. I think it's it's cleaner, but I, I'm, I'm willing to go along with number three if the board reviews it in a much shorter time period than is proposed in the uh, staff report here, or I should say adds a review on. One of them says December. I'd like to see something in about 30 days to see whether there has been uh, 30 or 45 days, depending upon how long it takes for full implementation, to see whether we've seen an uptake uh, whether there are costs and also it allows us to be more flexible in determining uh, any kind of issues with the variant about whether we need to do that. I just believe that when we have Dr. Newell uh, in the media almost every single day saying vaccinate, 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 we need to make sure that we are the leaders showing that we can do this too, that there isn't a, a separate set of standards for us as county leaders going out and saying to do it versus what we're asking the community to do. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with number two, as I said, I think it is um, ultimately going to be the cleanest way. And I think, unfortunately, it's going to be the, the real way to actually increase uptake. I, I'm going to be, I'm skeptical that number three is going to really increase the number of county uh, employees that are vaccinated. I think that those who are vaccine hesitant will uh, maybe come along because of the approval of the Pfizer vaccine altogether. And I think those that, that, that aren't supportive of vaccines aren't going to feel motivated because of a testing requirement. I do think the testing requirement may help catch some early cases to keep other employees in the community safe. And there's a value to that, which is why I would support it. But if the goal here is for 100% vaccination, I don't think number three realistically gets us there, which is why I'd like to see a review of this policy in about, uh, I'll take the CIO's recommendation on how long it'll take to implement it. But either a month or 45 days, and then we can come back again in December for what the, the report currently recommends. But that's, that's where I am. And, and, and just great, great appreciation uh, for Dr. Newell and her work on all of this. Um, I'm supportive also of the mask mandate, as she knows. Uh, but every time there's a mandate that comes down, this is language that, that concerns a lot of people. And I think right now in a hyper-polarized polarized political environment, there's people who uh, historically would have been fine with mandates that for whatever reason now are, are disproportionately not. Um, but I got to say, uh, it, it's been approved. It's not experimental. And those that are unfortunately going to hospitals um, are all of a sudden finding religion, trusting doctors, nurses, and any kind of experimental medication that will come their way. So I do think that realistically, we need to just uh, make sure that, that, that everybody is vaccinated. And if that requires a mandate from our employees to start, then we should consider that. But Mr. Palacios, my, I guess my one question to you would be, uh, would 30 or 45 days be enough for you to come back with an initial analysis of, of the numbers as well as any costs that have been incurred?
time because the recommendation before you includes a period of 30 days for employees to comply. And the hope would be that with the choice of vaccination or mandatory testing, some employees may go and obtain the vaccine. So I think a realistic picture of coming back to you with some data and numbers to after giving a period of compliance would be November. Uh, so define compliance, just so I know, is that a, your first shot? Is that fully vaccinated? Because obviously there's a couple week period in between the two. How are we defining it? Because I mean, it, it, what, what you would be stating, if I'm understanding this correctly, is that somebody on the 29th day may be going and getting their first shot. I think if the goal here is to actually extend this moment, that we're not intending to have that level of delay. Um, and so either people are going to do this now or they're, they're realistically not going to do it. I think that, that I, I think that you've got two sets of people. You had a hesitant people based on both information or con valid concerns in their mind anyway about uh, the safety of the, of the vaccine, which I don't share those concerns on the EUA. But then you've got people that are just simply not going to get it. And I think that that data should be able to parse out pretty quickly, actually, of those who are just not willing to do it. So if you could explain those two elements about whether it's, it's full vaccination or single shot um, and what your thoughts are. Being that we were hoping to be able to track both. So in the notices that will go out to employees who are unvaccinated, giving them their options, we will see pretty fast what the reactions. We also know there is a requirement under the law to also look at religious accommodations and medical accommodations. So we're think the 30 day compliance, we were hoping that that would even be for the first shot. And then we can certainly track those who are in the process of getting vaccinated. So we would have data that shows who's in the process, perhaps not fully vaccinated. And then also we'd have a sense of those who adamantly say, I won't be getting vaccinated. I'm going to do the weekly test. So then we can look at those numbers. So I'm, I am confident that we can certainly come back to you in October with some information. I think we would be able to come back with more thorough information in November, because I do think if there are those folks who need the accommodation and qualify for a religious or medical condition, that kind of process, getting doctor's notes and going through the religious um, process will take at least two weeks. And I think that if somebody is denied an accommodation, then they still have that choice to make whether they could even get that first shot in September. Okay, so what I'm hearing then is that we should know in 30 days, since we have a 30 day compliance of whether or not somebody got a first shot, got an exemption or is gonna be tested, which means within 45 days, I should be, we should have the data. I mean, it, we'll it, it's, still, it, it's still complete. I mean, it, I recognize it's still one shot versus two shot, but we know the direction that the employees have chosen to go and we know what costs are being, uh, if any, are being charged to the county as a result of that. So I, I'll still, I'll, I'll move from the 30 to the 45 days, whatever that time period is of, of the meeting uh, the first meeting in in October, then that, that would accommodate that. I appreciate that information. So, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I want to add a clarifying note that if if your board is is looking at option two or option three right now, and if you were to go with option three, we wouldn't be looking at at religious or medical exemptions because uh, there's a testing option. So the, so nobody so it's it's mandatory vaccination or testing, and so. There, there wouldn't be a, a review of, of accommodations under that option, but there would be a review of those accommodations under option two. Okay, I apologize. We were speak, I think that the board is leaning toward option three, just based on some of the comments that were raised earlier by three of the members, or including myself, I'm fine with doing number three, but I do want the board to be able to review this again in early October to see whether it's actually moved in moved um, the mark on this as far as how many people are actually getting vaccinated, which is the end goal. I mean, really, that's the true goal. The goal isn't to get a bunch of people tested. The goal is to actually um, set the expectation of, of, of a community that is uh, as nearly vaccinated as possible, both, I mean, obviously understanding that there's both aid restrictions and some issues as to why some people can't get, get um, vaccinated. But so I appreciate that clarification from County Council. I, it doesn't change then whatever data you bring back to me in early October should help inform the board's decision of whether we need to move to a mandatory number two in essence, or whether we could stay on the track that we're on. That's what I'm looking for to come back for. Thank you. Uh, third district supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, <clears throat> um, let me just say, I'm in general agreement with the direction uh, that supervisor friend is outlining. 
<clears throat> which is to start with option three, gather some data, and then in 45 days, make a determination about whether we need to move to a mandate um, as, as the adjacent counties have done. Um, I think we're doing this for a couple of reasons. One, we're trying to keep um, uh, the county community, the county as an organization, healthy and safe. I just had a friend uh, who was vaccinated who had to be readmitted to the hospital uh, with a second uh, case of COVID. And it, was a, it's a, it is a very serious situation, and especially uh, for coworkers who have kids or people with uh, underlying health conditions at home. Um, the, the folks who are choosing not to get vaccinated at this point are putting their, putting their coworkers, their friends, their family, and the community at risk. Uh, and um, we need to, at minimum, uh, have testing uh, and ideally have uh, vaccinations happen. And then the second part of it is, I think, um, you know, the other jurisdictions are watching us right now. And when you add up the collective workforce of the county plus the, the four cities, um, you're talking probably close to a thousand people that are potentially uh, uh, would be vaccinated if we move towards that. And a thousand people in a community our size is a significant number given uh, given the spread that Dr. Newell outlined. So uh, I think um, you know from a from an institutional point of view we have a responsibility, and then from a community wide uh, health, community health point of view we have a responsibility. Um, and I'm okay with starting with number three, um, and then seeing where we're at, and then looking at uh, whether we need to move to no number two, option two. Thank you. District Supervisor Caput, any comments? You bet. Thanks, thanks uh, Bruce. Yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, if, if I have my numbers correct, we're talking about maybe 250 out of 2,500 uh, in the uh, county workers uh, have not been vaccinated. So we're talking about 250, of, you know, give or take a few. All right, you bet. And uh, yeah, I, I like option three because uh, the testing part, although it's not perfect, it, it gives a, an option. Uh, we've all, in the last year and a half, we've been through of, you know, difficult situations on from all sides. And uh, there are some uh, of the 250 that do not want to get vaccinated. I, 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 I just don't want to get in a situation where basically if, if we made it mandatory and they refused, we'd be, we'd be firing them. Is that correct? And I, I just don't want to have another fight uh, going on uh, while we're working on everything else in the county. Go ahead. I do want to just clarify and address the comment that you made, Supervisor Caput, about if somebody is not taking care of either testing or vaccinating, you don't want to fire anybody. However, no. they would. The, the, te the testing <laughs> part is okay. However, if an employee refuses to do both, we would need a mechanism for compliance. And in the staff report, we have indicated that if there's a refusal to vaccinate or test, it will lead up to termination. And I just want to make that clear. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it, it, yeah, with option three, we're okay, uh, but uh, I guess when we come back, uh, I don't know. It, it's it's just a real tough situation uh, for everybody right now. And what what percentage of that two hundred and fifty uh, they're going to be working virtually uh, from their homes, possibly? Do we know how many of those would be? Um, most county employees um, are working a hybrid schedule. The majority, I meaning they're coming in the office part of the week and working virtually part of the week. So that's how most of these employees, but some employees because of the nature of the job are required to come in every day. There's a very few employees actually who are working 100% virtually at this point. Right, okay. Would uh, some of them have an option to work virtually until uh, the pandemic blows over? 
um, not not for the reason, not to avoid uh, getting vaccinated. That would not be a valid reason to work virtually or to not test. That's not acceptable. So yeah. the only reason somebody's working virtually is because because it meets the business needs of the county, uh, and it is uh, it is a, a privilege being given to our employees in general to work hybridly part of the week, but it's not based on their desire to not get vaccinated or get tested. Yeah. And so technically, uh, if it became mandatory, uh, they would be fired. Uh, and uh, then they'd have to go on unemployment. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a mess uh, all the way around. Both they're not getting the vaccination and they're refused. That's probable, but um, I, we, I don't, it doesn't look like that's where we're going to be going. So. Uh, yeah, I, I get your point, they, but uh, I know they lose their pension. They lose, I don't know, one of so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, I just before I open up the, I just want to thank our county employees. You know, the the eighty five, probably ninety percent compliance with being vaccinated is phenomenal, as was stated. It is. is stated previously. Uh, it's probably the best of any other governing agency I know of anyway. And uh, I want you know, just thank our county employees for stepping up uh, under the circumstances and, and to really offering new programs like it's just Vax the Valley and my San Lorenzo Valley for, for offering more opportunities for people to become vaccinated now. So it's uh, as we have in various other areas of the uh, county as well. So uh, uh, I can't say enough about our county employees for the services they're providing and for them becoming vaccinated to uh, really uh, defer the spread of this, especially with the Delta variant. I'm going to open up. Well, what, real quick, uh, what about SEIU and uh, that's, uh, union reps and stuff like that? So I have notified SEIU, who happens to be our largest unit, that your board was considering this item. And under state labor laws, we are obligated to notice them after your action and meet and confer over the impacts. So they are expecting me to correspond with them today to let them know what your action is. And I will also be making a offer to all of the bargaining units to meet and confer over the impacts and the impacts that they will want to really dig into and talk about is really what are the ramifications to employees if they do not comply. And we're prepared to have that conversation with them and they had appreciated the heads up that your board was considering this item today and are expecting to hear from me based on your action. Thank you. Okay, we'll open up to the public now. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, maybe someone misspoke earlier when they implied that the FDA or FDF, CDC are part of the federal government. They are independent corporations. Um, there is a lot of information around the world that the four types of stings, like only could they be called a vaccine after they changed the law earlier in January 21, both of the DNA and the MNRA um, changed the individual into a patented individual. And the Supreme, excuse me, the Supreme Court in 2013 made a legal, legal distinction and made it unlawful or legal to patent a natural human being. But if a, or a plant or anything, but if it's been modified, it can be patented. It has no rights. So I kind of have a lot of questions. How could I limit them? Um, can anyone in this room or anyone on the planet um, isolate any virus in a duplicatable form? That answer is no. The PCR test was never meant for to replicate situations like this. And depending on how many factors it's repeated, its ability be, to become imprecise increases. So why is it even being used? The World Health Organization has already admitted fault here, said they're gonna stop using it at the end of this year. What's been going on the past 18 months? Complete cover-ups and lies. So what else? Uh, you know, it's interesting in this room with everybody, not many people are talking about neuropathic medicine. And, um, you know, figures don't lie, but liars sure can figure. Um, 
You know about the delta variants? It's in the deltoid muscle. Let them go a little longer. Okay, go ahead. Um, another speaker. Thank you. Pull the mic down, please, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. There is no isolation of the genome worldwide, including the California Health Department. We have a letter from them. CV19 does not exist. Cell cultures of the COVID-19 treated patients were lab tested by Stanford, Cornell, Dr. Robert Young, and they found influenza A and influenza B, that clinically that is flu A and flu B. Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Gawa Cowan, uh, the frontline doctors, Dr. Simone Gold, Dr. Robert Young, they've all been asking worldwide for the genome of this isolation, and it is negative. CDC, page 39, on the COVID does not have an isolation of the genome. So where did the flu go in 2020? It disappeared. If we don't have an isolation, we don't have a real ostensible disease. There's no need for masks and vaccines and vaccines are not, these COVID vaccines are not vaccines. They do not create immunity. They are injections. Thousands have died. It's not seen on television, but if you go to alternative news, we have thousands that have permanent disabilities. They produce spike proteins in the lipid membrane that damages all the cells, especially your blood bearing organs and your brain. The graphene oxide in these injections is extremely toxic and it reacts to the frequencies of the Gs, 4G and 5G. And I just want to say, please do your research from my heart. Do your own research on this. You were asking people to take a very devastating injection that may kill them off within two years or sooner. And these are people that have worked with you and served you. Please, before you do this, do your own research. Thank you. Any other, any other comments from the public here? I just found out about this, so I don't have facts and figures. But I'm afraid too often I've been in front of this board before in facts and figures didn't make a difference. The law will eventually catch up to this kind of situation. And there will be lawsuits eventually trying to set this right. Look into your heart and do what you know is right. If you take the side of Satan, you still have time to change your mind and join with God and do the right thing and he will forgive you. Anybody else uh, in the chamber that would like to address the board? Do we have anybody? On yes, I have five speakers on Zoom, six. Carol, your microphone is available. Good afternoon, this is Carol Bjorn. I'm here today to urge you to go with option one on this to keep the status quo. Um, and for, for various reasons, um, Dr. Fauci, who was on MSNBC last week um, on Wednesday, August 18th, he said that vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant have the same viral levels as the unvaccinated infected with this variant. This means vaccinated people can easily spread the Delta, end quote. So these vaccines do not prevent transmission. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to have any kind of mandate of vaccines. Secondly, and this is really a question for Dr. Newell, why haven't you been promoting early intervention? There are lots of early interventions that are available that are a lot less risky than vaccines and that are much more effective. And then people aren't hospitalized at all. 
And Ryan, I'm really sorry that your friend was hospitalized after they had the vaccination, but there's another concept everyone should probably research. It's called antibody dependent enhancement. And this occurred with the vaccine trials with the first SARS vaccine in 2008. They did it only on animals and all of the animals had antibody dependent enhancement. And that means they were vaccinated, but then when they came in contact with the virus later on, they became even more ill. So that's what you're seeing right now. So the, if you continue vaccinating people, you're not gonna see less disease. You're not gonna see less of anything. There's been 85% of your county workers that have already decided to vaccinate. That's great. You guys should be done. You don't have any legal authority either to mandate a vaccine for a worker. I think Joanne is right. You're gonna see a lot of lawsuits. And the other thing is you're completely ignoring the risk of vaccination. 11,000 people have died from the COVID-19 vaccine according to the VAERS, which is a government website. So you all really need to think about this and not Caller 1192, your microphone is available. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Am I on? Thank you. Um, I'd like to address the county employees and county residents about the safety of this so-called vaccine. It's time to think for yourself and use common sense. When people go to get vaccinated, there's supposed to be a piece of paper in the vaccine box that says what's in the vaccine. It's called a material safety data sheet. It is left intentionally blank. How can you give your informed consent to an experimental vaccine or even an approved medical treatment if you don't even know what's in it? Blind trust is not a virtue. You will only have yourself to blame for the adverse reactions. I'm gonna play out the rest of my time with an audio recording by a Catholic friar, Brother Bugnolo. And if you'll just wait a second, I'm gonna start playing that for you. Thank you. Those making these vaccines know these vaccines will kill you. They know science, they're not stupid. When you spend billions of dollars to build a factory to produce vaccines, you have enough scientists to know that antibody farming will kill you. And we have to face the reality of what's going on that this is the intention. The intention is to exterminate humanity. Somewhere around uh, nearly 2 billion people, I hear it say, have been vaccinated. Now, according to Montagnier, anyone who has taken these vaccines that prime your immune system to react excessively the next time you run into a coronavirus, these all will be dead in two years. In the next two years, we will see 2 billion people die on Earth. If you're in a state like some of my relatives where 85% of the people are vaccinated, everyone on your street will be dead, except you who haven't taken it and the others who haven't taken it. And uh, as an anthropologist, I, I feel um, strongly motivated to tell you. Erica, your microphone is available. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you. Well, I just want to start um, by sharing a bit of my history. Uh, when I was 29, I had a mini stroke. At that time, I was given flying colors for health by my physicians. They're always, you know, great, you're doing awesome, you know? And I had a stroke, essentially, a mini stroke. Now, this type of medical intervention has risks and it's not acceptable to assume that people will be fine by taking it. People like me who have some serious health history need to be able to say no. And the offer of just taking tests well, the thing is, is those tests have ethylene oxide and ethylene oxide is cancerous. So it's to asking people to put themselves at risk for cancer. So that may lead to some issues for you guys later on down the road. 
one confusion seems to be that this vaccine, these vaccines are now approved. My understanding is it was just an extension of the Emergency Youth Authorization Act. And even your own evidence shows that vaccinated people and unvaccinated people spread COVID and therefore, you know, if it exists, they spread it. And since there's still as much transmission among both groups, there's no real benefit. Thank you. Tanjuria, your microphone is available. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Kenza Temsamani. I live with my family in Capitola and I vote. Thank you, Manu Koenig. Right now, all over California, mandates are being created and enforced, which take away people's right to choose for themselves and their families. COVID injections were first offered as a choice, often with a reward. Then increasingly, it has become a situation in which there is no more choice because one will lose one's employment, access to the public domain, or even to family and friends. We were told the COVID injections are highly effective at controlling the spread and decreasing the likelihood of getting COVID. And yet Israel, the country with the highest COVID vaccination rate, 78% for those 12 and older, I refer you to the article in Science Magazine of August 16th called A Grim Warning from Israel, Vaccination Blunts But Does Not Defeat Delta. The article states that breakthrough cases are not the rare events the term implies. As of 15th August, 514 Israelis were hospitalized with severe or critical COVID-19, a 31% increase from just four days earlier. Of the 514, 59% were fully vaccinated. Which brings me to my next point, mandates. To force another individual to do something is morally and ethically wrong and usually feels wrong in the conscience of the enforcer. If you are a parent, you know what I'm talking about. In positive discipline, we say good parenting feels right. Even if you, the people in charge, think that vaccination is good for the community, what gives you the right to make a choice over what goes into someone else's body? And for people who do not wish to get the injection, it could actually be harmful regardless of what the ingredients are. Think of the placebo effect in which some people get better when they believe that they are getting medicine. If people believe that the COVID injection is harmful or poisonous to them, then regardless of what its ingredients are, it may cause detriment to their health. Unmute. Hi, sorry about that. Hi, my name, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Kat. Um, I did not prepare a speech. I wanted just to touch on a few thoughts as I was listening. Carol said much of what I wished to say. Um, we talk about all of these benefits of these vaccines and how they are the safest way to, quote, beat COVID. And uh, that is such a joke when we know that they have not prevented transmission. Um, and all of these mitigation strategies have actually been more harmful to our health than helpful. And I think it's just an abomination uh, to our county and everyone that lives here to have to go through the circus act of putting on, you know, face coverings that do not prevent viral transmission that actually inhibit um, our, the exchange of gases. Uh, I came and spoke about this for schools last year. I just, I'm appalled uh, to see what you're putting our children through this, with this upcoming year. And now to see that you're going to be pushing these experimental, even though you say it's not experimental, the trials for Pfizer were not set to be complete until 2023. And now they still don't have adequate safety data on the effects on pregnant women and the fetus and their embryos and their fetuses. We do not have adequate uh, data on how this is affecting teenagers. I do know that the rates of myocarditis have gone through the roof. If you go to the government website, VAERS, you can see that there's been 13,000 deaths post COVID vaccinations. Over 54,000 have been hospitalized and over 595,000 have had adverse reactions to these uh, COVID vaccines. So that's really something we should be thinking about. And when I hear you talking about how this is the safest way to beat this uh, virus, I disagree. Uh, it's clear that uh, many viable and affordable treatments. We were suppressed. Um, even bad science was created to make them appear dangerous. These are safe and affordable. 
Call in user four, your microphone is available. As a reminder, just star six to unmute your call. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Um, this is Marilyn Garrett, and I'd like to read a sentence here. In the practice of medicine, sometimes the dogma about a certain subject becomes so rigid that even when the truth is sitting in plain sight, physicians, and I would add others, simply cannot see it. You've been hearing the truth about vaccines and problems with all these lockdowns. I'd also like to read from learntherisk.org, a publication called Vaccines for Health or Profit? Question mark by Brandy Vaughn, who was a um, Merck, former Merck pharmaceutical sales executive and founder of Learn the Risk. Unfortunately, she's not alive. Um, the, the book opens up, Medical Freedom is a Human Right. First and foremost, mandatory vaccine laws are a violation of the basic human right to voluntary, con voluntary consent without coercion to any and all medical procedures, tests, experiments, and preventative measures. The Nuremberg Code was established following World War II based on the fact that all medical products have an inherent health risk and serious side effects, vaccines included. I do not want to see you kings of the county, as I call this all-male board, further inflict harm on the population by mandating. Laura, your microphone has been unmuted. We'll move over to caller 6094. Hi, can Hi. you hear me? Yes, now we can. We're back to Laura. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm calling because I wanted to make it clear that what you're doing is in violation of the Nuremberg Code which is international law and the penalty for violating what for doing what you're doing is death and you will be held accountable at some point whether on this planet or with god so you need to <laughs> you need to do what's right for humanity and take a stand and stop doing what you're doing all for the money we know what you're doing that's all i have to say We'll go to caller 6094. Your microphone is available. It is star six to unmute your phone. Second call for caller 6094. The caller has access to their microphone, but has not unmuted. That, that's, uh, Hi, that's I don't know why it's taking me again, but sure, I'll, <clears throat> I'll continue talking. Um, all of this information that's being shared today is not secret. It's on government websites to show how many people have been dying and been injured. And the censorship is outrageous. It's just like in Nazi Germany when Hitler was putting stars on the Jews, you're creating a medical apartheid separating humanity based on their vaccination status. It's coercion and force, it's immoral. This, this has to stop. 
<laughs> you guys are really taking it way too far. Um, the, the propaganda and the mind control and the psychological warfare on the American people is, is beyond anything I, I could even imagine. But um, those of us who are awake are, are gaining in numbers and gaining in organization, and you will be held accountable. That's all I have to say. There are no other speakers for public comment. Okay, I don't, I don't think there's any other person in the uh, audience or the chamber that wants to speak. I'll bring it back to the board um, for consideration for action. Anybody? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move. Um, I believe the recommended action is for number three. I'll just confirm that. If, if not, I'll just specifically move item number three. Um, Mr. Palacios, is the recommended action number three? Just confirm? That is correct. Okay, then I'll move the recommended actions um, and I'll also add additional direction to have a report back in 45 days with an update on any costs, um, the additional uptake from uh, from from the employees of, of the vaccine numbers, any lessons learned, and then to provide the options again um, of status quo or uh, I guess in this case, it'd be status quo or mandatory vaccines at the time, just to allow the board a second opportunity to review this in 45 days. Second. Supervisor Coonerty. Okay, yes, Coonerty. Yes. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Aye. Koenig. Aye. Friend. I'm sorry, Supervisor. Friend. Okay, he is mouthing. Aye, but we can't hear yeah. him. Aye. I don't Good. know if it's not working. I'm sorry. Thank you. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? This is option three, right? Correct right. for option three uh, with additional aye. direction. Right. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson? Aye. Thank you. You have motion passes unanimously. Okay. Very good. Um, we'll go to item number 14 to uh, consider the proposed Santa Cruz County operational plan for fiscal years 2021-23, that's two years, and direct the County Administrative Office to return on September 28th, 2021 with the final plan for board approval as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrator of Officer. Uh, we have Vision Santa Cruz County report, attachment A, operational plan, attachment B, operational plan brochure. Um, thank you for being here. And Nicole Coburn, I think, is going to present. Yes. Good afternoon, Chair McPherson and members of the board. So I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant County Administrative Officer. I'm here today with Sven Stafford, Principal Administrative Analyst. And we're going to be presenting on the proposed operational plan for the next two fiscal years, 2021 through 2023. And I, before we begin, I just want to thank all the departments for working with us over the course of the past eight months on their operational plan objectives. Um, they've worked very hard, taken all of the feedback given to them, and I believe we have um, an excellent plan to present today. So this is our agenda for this afternoon. We're gonna to briefly touch on our strategic and operational plans and provide a brief overview. We'll then get into um, our operational plan for the new two year period, talk about the development process and some of our theme areas, as well as give you a brief tour of our objectives online. And then we'll wrap up by discussing our next steps. So just to remind you where we've been, three years ago we were here and the board approved the county's first strategic plan for the six year period of 2018 through 2024. Uh, following approval of that plan, which included the county's vision, mission and values, along with six focus areas and 24 goals, we um, went about developing our first two year operational plan um, that plan was approved two years ago in 2019, and that contained 55 strategies and 180 objectives for achieving the county's uh, vision, mission, and goals. Um, 
those objectives were based on a SMART framework. And just to remind you, a SMART framework means that our objectives are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, so that means we're trying to achieve very specific things and we're trying to measure them to see the how, count, how the county is performing. Um, our new two-year operational plan for the next two-year period contains 148 new objectives as well as some carryover objectives from the original plan. And um, we've added a new element to our SMART framework and that is the E at the end, which stands for equity. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. So um, in terms of how we developed the plan, this past winter, we started in on training for county staff that focused in on measurement and equity to provide them with key concepts and definitions and remind them about our SMART framework. We followed that up with in this past spring with working with departments on drafting their objectives, providing feedback on those drafts and revising them as we move forward. Then this spring and summer, um, Sven along with county staff presented to 25 commissions to talk about our operational planning process and to give them an update as to where we're at. And they received um, some feedback from those commissions. And today we're here to present our proposed operational plan and to receive any feedback that the board might have as well as the public. So our new two-year operational plan focuses in on three main focus areas. Um, the first is COVID-19 recovery. Uh, I think as we're all acutely aware, the pandemic has changed the nature of our lives and how we work. And we wanna ensure that everyone can adapt and create more resiliency within communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Another theme area is fire recovery. Uh, we are just about one year away from, um, we're one year into um, our CZU fire recovery. Um, as we all know, that fire burned 86,000 acres and destroyed almost 1,500 structures. Um, we're currently watching the state's largest fire in history burn to our north. And um, here locally, the board established our Office of Re Response, Recovery and Resilience, or OR3 as we like to call it, um, not only to recover from the fires, but also to ensure a better response to future disasters. Uh, OR3 is guiding policies to make our community more resilient in the face of, ever, of the ever-changing climate. Our third area is equity. Um, also a year ago in August, the board declared racism a public health crisis. And this past December, the board directed our office to incorporate equity and social justice into our operational plan. Um, our office is going to be continuing to work with departments as well as external partners, public health and the circle on anti-racism, economic and social justice. Um, to make sure diverse voices continue to be involved in developing county objectives and um, addressing changes as we move forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sven, who's gonna go a little bit more into depth in our focus areas. All right, thanks, Nicole, and good afternoon, board. Uh, in terms of COVID-19 recovery, the 21-23 operational plan builds on the county's Save Lives Santa Cruz County program to slow the spread, adapt and adjust, vaccinate and treat, and elevate readiness. And all county departments have submitted at least one objective to respond, recover, or become more resilient in the face of the pandemic. Uh, examples of this include uh, working with community partners, especially in South County, to maintain and strengthen the relationships and programs built over the last 18 months. Uh, an example from our Housing for Health Division of moving vulnerable households from our quarantine shelters and into appropriate housing. Uh, from our Public Health Division in terms of maintaining and increasing lab and epidemiological capacity to be able to respond to future public health crises. And then from a variety of departments uh, on investing trust in county staff to maintain remote work schedules, be productive, and increase access to services both online and in person. In terms of fire recovery, uh, our community and county response have been immense. Uh, almost all of our 
debris removal is complete and the recovery permit center is currently achieving uh, seven to 10 day turnarounds for most rebuilding permits. Uh, OR3, county fire planning, public works and environmental health, along with a variety of other departments have contributed operational plan objectives. Uh, and some highlights of those include uh, uh, in planning, taking best practices from the recovery permit center and embedding those benefits for all county residents, uh, improving infrastructure through public works and, and planning also uh, so that evacuation routes are clear of hazards and information is available and clearly communicated, uh, ensuring our, both, our most vulnerable have resources and that we coordinate community ride to access the knowledge and generosity within the county. And then also with OR3 updating our climate action strategy uh, to incorporate new estimates uh, of impact and to provide in, an environmental justice lens uh, to the impact of climate change. In the, the final focus area in terms of embedding equity, uh, we've really worked with our, with our departments to uh, improve our SMART framework by adding the E and providing training to departments to create more measurable objectives. Uh, within that measurement, disaggregating the data is really required to create objectives that move the needle towards uh, more equitable programs and policies. Uh, and county departments have submitted 80 objectives in the plan uh, that work across one lens of equity. Uh, and a, the range includes geography, race, age, ability, income, and gender. Uh, and some highlights of this include uh, internal improvements uh, like implicit bias training and, uh, and health and human services joining the government alliance on race and equity. External uh, objectives include uh, improvements like removing barriers through uh, better language translation services, community engagement and partnership policies and collaborative programming. Uh, making sure our, uh, our youth of color, for example, in our communities have the opportunities they need to achieve their goals. And then also making uh, unprecedented investments in South County, uh, including the new building at 500 Westridge. Uh, and so now I'll ask the clerk to share the um, website screen and we'll take a little tour of the operational plan. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank uh, Tom Melconi and, and Yan Zhang from ISD, uh, who did a lot of the work in getting this website up and up and running. Um, as you can see here, the uh, we have our uh, county vision, mission, and values, and underneath it, the the 21-23 operational plan. Uh, here we can simply click on see objectives and it'll take us to our, Stephanie, can I have control? Mm -hmm. um, it's actually, it's all right if we go out of full screen, so I can see the whole browser. Um, yeah, this will be better. Okay, excellent. Um, so here we can cycle through the, the various goals. Um, within this, we can also uh, cycle through our strategies that are linked to the goals. And uh, at the bottom, there's also uh, space here on the one and two to um, see the full list of objectives that are related to these. Uh, and so if we look at one objective, just to go through one, uh, this is from our probation department that uh, by June 2023, uh, they'll increase the percentage of youth of color on track to graduate to 50%. Uh, below that, you can see the key steps related to achieving the objective. And below that, there's a plan reference to see where the objective is linked, uh, target information. Uh, so you can see the, the specific target uh, baseline information, so currently 39% of youth of color on track to graduate, and then a progress, uh, a progress marker. And so all the new 
objectives have 0% progress and the first update to this plan will be in winter 2022. Uh, we'll, we'll see progress updates for all uh, 180, uh, 182 objectives. Uh, a couple other uh, things to just to show and note here. On, the, on this page, you can see a link to the archive of the 2019-21 operational plan so people can easily navigate to that. You can also come here and sort the objectives in various, uh, by various um, categories. So here you can look at it in terms of timeline when objectives are supposed to be completed. Uh, you can see objectives by department. Uh, you can see them in terms of our different equity lenses. So external uh, communications, community partnerships and county services and then internal facing objectives uh, like county facilities uh, our internal systems and, and uh, objectives targeted towards our workplace. In terms of COVID and fire recovery, you can also see objectives sorted by category of response, recovery and resilience. And this stands for fire recovery as well. Uh, the three, three categories of response, recovery and resilience. Um, and so we just encourage people to go on the, on the website and play around. Um, one additional thing that I wanted to um, highlight uh, or bring the board's attention to is the just amount of collaboration that happens on the plan. Uh, and so this is a sort of web of how uh, all our work is interdependent. Uh, if we look at our COVID-19 related objectives, you can see that uh, health services has the most connections built in. If we look at uh, our fire related objectives, you can see that OR3 has the most, uh, um, has the most connections, which is nice to see that it's a, you know, a department that's existed for six months, but is already building uh, the relationships within the county and as evidenced here in the plan. And then within the, equity related objectives. Um, obviously the, uh, the board is named uh, racism a public health crisis. And so it makes sense that health here has the most connections, uh, but we should also be proud that every department submitted at least one objective that attempted to embed equity. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Nicole and uh, ask the clerk to highlight our presentation again. So today we're asking um, for the board to provide any guidance to our office on the proposed operational plan, and then to direct our office to return at the end of September with the final plan for 21, 20 through 23, at which time we'll ask for the board to approve the plan. Um, and we're happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. I'd like to make some uh, statements I could have made before you made your presentation uh, that I'd like to congratulate the CEO and his whole staff, Sven and Nicole Coburn in particular, for developing what I think is a very worthwhile operations plan for the next two years. If the general public wants to know what's on our mind and where we really want to go, they can refer to this and see this is our this is our standard. This is what we want to do. And um, to much of, I'm proud to see that the county established its first strategic plan. Uh, a few years ago, and I'm equally pleased that the resulting operations plan that we uh, have been implementing for the past two years has been a solid success. We've accomplished a lot of those goals. Uh, the next two year op operations plan re uh, really reflects lessons learned, and I think several of the key objectives are, are worth a special mention that we have accomplished, and I could have mentioned this earlier on as well. The COVID-19 recovery effort will provide community grants increase our epidemiology uh, lab capacity to provide needed testing and tracing, and perhaps most importantly, provide rental assistance to those in danger of losing their housing. Um, in terms of objectives relative to, relative to fire recovery and resiliency, the county will update our climate action strategy, which will look at how we will need uh, to adapt to climate change, especially ex extreme natural disasters and weather. And one suggestion I think we might, I might make, and I'm sorry to make this late, um, we, we talk about fire recovery, but I think we need to say fire preparation too, because 
we have to set some objectives of what we want to do to prevent hopefully a never never uh, realistic fire in the future so i mean aside from recovery which we've done a phenomenal job at uh, what are we going to be doing to prepare for the next disaster a fire disaster many of which are taking place throughout california and i Sorry to bring this up at this point, late, but uh, I think that if we added that phrase, it would be very helpful. Um, uh, the county will also aim to reduce the number of fossil fuel vehicles in our fleet, as well as implement a permanent remote workforce policy that will greatly reduce the vehicle miles traveled to county offices, hopefully that Highway 1 corridor in particular. Uh, the Unified per Permit Center between Public Works and Planning uh, to be established uh, next year and will enhance the county's ability to provide uh, more efficient customer service to residents and businesses uh, seeking building permits. And last, last but not least, I'd like to highlight the objectives of the county has set for itself embedded uh, in equity considerations within all community services. Uh, we will be providing translation for all board meetings, training all county workers on how to recognize their own implicit and conscious bias toward others and establishing which has been mentioned the south county service center campus that will be more centrally located for community members to access uh, county service at the marine center uh, or 500 westridge uh, in the south county but those were some real key and important objectives that are in this new plan and i'm looking forward to supporting it and uh, congratulations uh, to the cao to bring this to our attention and saying we need to do this uh, without his and the, his whole office's directive and uh, saying how, how much we need this, we wouldn't be where we are and we've accomplished a lot. There's a lot more to do, but uh, it can't be overstated that uh, we need a plan of attack and this is it. And the public can see what we've accomplished and then what our goals are in the near future and for the next four years as well. Uh, I don't know if there's any other comments from the board members, um, Supervisor Koenig. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Stafford and uh, Ms. Coburn for the great presentation. The website is incredibly easy to navigate uh, and, and kind of fun, too, uh, so it lays it out very well. I appreciate that presentation, um, and uh, as the Chair pointed out, I would encourage any members of the public to go explore it as well. Um, I also appreciate the emphasis on uh, objectives being smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, and so uh, really in my review is uh, of the objectives, just making sure that they are, are consistent in meeting, um, meeting the, the outline of uh, specifically being measurable. Um, and uh, I'm really glad that county fire is included this year. Uh, that was definitely, um, I think we all see the obvious need for that now. Um, and uh, Honestly, our, our citizens deserve accountability from County Fire, and uh, this will be a good way of ensuring that happens. I'll just point out a couple of uh, specific objectives that I see could, that could use improvement, um, and we'll be sure to follow up with uh, more specific notes as well. Um, but on number 298, fire surveillance, um, you know, again, fire being an important topic and, and needing to make sure that uh, these objectives are measurable. Right now, it just says that a number of cameras, or sorry, it just, um, find it here. Uh, it just says by June 2023, County Fire will expand fire surveillance cameras throughout Santa Cruz County. Uh, so to ensure that this is measurable, I'd love to see the objective in terms of yeah, a number of cameras observing a percentage of the county. So for example, by June 2023, County Fire will have five cameras observing 85% of the county, something to that effect. Uh, on objective number 299 for volunteer firefighters, um, this right now reads that uh, by June 2023, County Fire will increase the number of volunteer firefighters by 5%. That's three volunteer firefighters. Um, we, we definitely have a crisis in the number of volunteer firefighters that, uh, today in the county. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak with our fire department advisory committee recently uh, who explained some of the challenges that they've been dealing with uh, as far as uh, really maintaining uh, volunteer firefighters once they've been trained. And so we have some fundamental issues we need to address in the way that we recruit and train volunteer firefighters. I think if we do those that successfully, we're going to see an increase of more than uh, 5% or three additional folks. And I think we really need to get at the, 
uh, the core of the process and, and aim our sights a little bit higher, uh, some more, you know, at, at, at least 15%, but there's gonna have to be some substantive changes to if we're really gonna address the shortfall. Um, moving on, bike lanes number 296, I was just happy to see this included that, that by June 2024, we'll install 10 miles of buffered and protected bike lanes on Soquel Drive between La Fonda Avenue and State Park Drive. Um, I think there's probably also some other important connections that we could look at. Um, uh, number 228, safe routes to school. I noticed that this, this could be a hard one to measure. I don't think we have the data currently uh, as far as accidents that happen near school uh, specifically. Um, you know, we do from the Office of Traffic Safety, a statewide agency have, um, have crash ranking data um, from across the state and specifically for our county. So it might actually be easier uh, to set an objective that is countywide rather than one specifically near schools. That's it's not to say that uh, safe routes to school are not important. It's an essential part of this, um, but uh, the objective might be easier to measure and complete using a countywide measure. Um, and just so people understand the importance of this, currently um, we are the, uh, actually the third worst in the state for bicycle accidents of any county. Um, that's all my comments and I, I'll follow up with any more specific recommendations on uh, some of the objectives, but thank you again for your good work and the great searchable database. Thank you. Um, Second District Supervisor Zach Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig, for your comments. And uh, it is really a remarkable sight to see this come to fruition at this point. I, I, I know Supervisor Coonerty shared this story, but a few years back before we hired um, our CIO, we had traveled around the state meeting with other counties to see how they did business and saw that, that one of the, the gaping holes was the fact that our county didn't have a strategic plan or this type of operational objectives. And to see it all come together here uh, is remarkable. Uh, I'll also say that it really is the framework and a very transparent and accountable um, blueprint for what work the county does. And, and it, it, it's if, if people are interested in, in, if the community is interested in what the county is planning to do, or what we currently do, then this, you can visit an easy to navigate site. And you can also uh, reach out to your elected officials to say whether or not you think things should be modified over the course of time. But but oftentimes the work that, that local governments do is is behind the scenes and, and people aren't familiar with how it impacts their day-to-day -day lives. I think having something like this available for the community to see and, and also for, uh, I would say for the media to take a deep dive into to help explain to the community the work that's being done is very valuable. So a great deal of appreciation to both Mr. Stafford and, and Ms. Coburn for your work and uh, looking forward to continue setting on this, these kinds of measurable goals moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, so I just wanna add my voice to the chorus appreciation uh, for the easy and transparent uh, accessibility of this. I also appreciate the new emphasis uh, on equity and making sure that it's really built in. You know, part of this is creating that transparency and awareness uh, for the community about what the county does. And the other thing is to really create uh, a culture that aligns with our values and vision uh, within the county family. And I think um, we're, we're well on the road to that. I love the connection map that showed how many of these goals uh, and departments are interconnected because uh, for too long, I think, We've treated each problem as to be solved within one silo of government, rec not recognizing the uh, interdependency and interconnection with other departments that are, that's needed. Um, I will go back uh, to make uh, one comment, which is, uh, and I made this when we were first beginning this process, and I think it's important for both the board and um, <clears throat> the community to recognize this, which is, I don't expect all these goals to be met. In fact, I. I'll be angry or frustrated if they are, uh, because it means that we've set the bar too low. Um, and we also want government to take risks and some of these things, uh, situations will change, will come up short or funding will run out. Uh, there's a variety of things, but I want, um, each department should be, should be setting one goal that's, that's definitely a stretch or a risk or an experiment or a pilot uh, and then seeing and then learning and 
uh, failing fast, right? As they say, uh, in terms of um, seeing what works and iterating or dropping it or changing it. And so um, I appreciate the effort and uh, I'm, I look forward to seeing uh, the next round uh, back in September, the final uh, version back in September. Uh, thank you. I, I want to thank uh, the staff uh, for your report and all the hard work you put into this. And, uh, I appreciate it all. Thank you. Okay. Are there any comments from the public? Any comments? Yes, one on Zoom. Kat, your microphone is available. Hi, I'm still listening. And, you know, I just thought it's really ironic and hypocritical to talk about um, caring about equality when I see clear segregation and discrimination happening right now with the discussion of um, uh, forced mandates. And eventually, as we know, you follow San Francisco pretty closely, you'll eventually be discussing a vaccine passport or a health pass of sorts, right? So it's a joke. I think I wanted to let everyone who's listening know that it's you are discriminating against uh, uh, the brown and black communities because we all know about the Tuskegee experiments. We all know that we are experimenting on them in African countries and in India. And so if you want to talk about equality, then you'd think twice about forcing people to take an experimental product, especially with such distrust in the pharmaceutical industry and their public private partnerships uh, with our government. Uh, look into um, Medical Racism, The New Apartheid. It is a film on childrenshealthdefense.org. Um, and also keep in mind that the CDC is heavily funded by a nonprofit called the CDC Foundation. Look at the partnerships uh, that, of the CDC Foundation with organizations. It's banking, military, tech, pharma, you name it. So when we defer to the CDC for these ridiculous guidelines, let's think about who's funding the CDC and our media and the messaging and the propaganda. Gail Newell, I also wanted to let you know, I'm disappointed that you had a, a seminar called Don't Kill Grandma. That is simply shameful. Lastly, I think with regard to the fires that you're discussing, we should all be thinking about um, how convenient it is for these fires to force us into smart cities, which is inevitably a goal of the um, UN and other billionaires and organizations. So. Oh, and also you're going to expand fire surveillance cameras. I find that highly suspect. I think the public is aware and you'll all be tried at some point and be held accountable for your ignorance and your incompetence. There are no other speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board to uh, for a motion to accept the County Operational Plan for fiscal years 2021-23. Move, move the recommended to... actions. Second. Second, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Cabot. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you, Chair. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. The hour of 325 have been reached. That is the last item on our agenda. Uh, we will adjourn now to the next Board of Supervisors meeting, the regularly scheduled meeting on September 14th. This meeting is adjourned. Rick.